morning and welcome to the Board of Commissioners zoning hearing for December 16th, 2014. As our customer, we will be having a uh, invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, the invocation is going to be presented by David Joyner, Senior Pastor, First Baptist Church of Ackworth. Thank you for being here. Who's doing the pledge? Officer Newt. Who? Newt. Who? Newt. <laughs> <laughs> the pledge will be uh, presented by our, our own Officer New, um, who's been with the department for 64 years, is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for those who wish to do so, please rise for the invocation and the pledge. Let's bow for prayer. Father God, for just a moment, we pause once again before the hustle and the hubbub of, hubbub of whatever lies before us in this day, and we invoke your presence, first and foremost in our lives, but also in this room. I am grateful that you are our friend who sticks closer than a brother and at whatever point we may need you the Bible says all we have to do is call and you are there because you care for us father I thank you this morning for mr. Lee and for his team and I pray your greatest blessings upon them the Bible says that if we lack wisdom in any area all we need to do is ask and you'll give so we pray for wisdom in this meeting this morning. I pray for each petitioner uh, that, Lord, you would give them a calmness of heart and a mental recollection of that which they desire to present. And again, I pray for this commission, wisdom, as they make their decisions. We're grateful for Cobb County, so many things for which we are blessed by being residents here. We thank you for our beloved America, and we pray that your hand of blessing might rest upon her. And Lord, this morning we pause for a moment in realization of the freedoms that we have, understanding that there are men and women who have donned the uniform, and today they have presented themselves as barricades to protect our freedoms, and how we ask your blessing on them and upon the proceedings this morning understanding that there is a great diversity represented in this room this morning I offer my prayer in the name of Jesus Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Officer. Appreciate you being here. We'll now call this meeting to order. We have uh, somewhat of a straightforward but moving target this morning with our uh, agenda. So we'll go through that, if you would, uh, John, and make have everybody understand where we're at. Um, Ms. Cupid will be out today. Um, she's on medical leave. And she'll be back with us, I guess, Thursday night. John, if you would, please. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Today's hearing will be conducted with the following process and procedure. Each case will be called in numerical order. When each case is called, the applicant is uh, requested to stand and signify that they are in attendance. Then we're gonna call for any opposition to signify that they are here also so that they can be counted for the official record. After the counting of the opposition, the applicant and any opposition will be asked to come forward, be sworn in, so they can present testimony to the Board of Commissioners. The applicant will testify first, and then the opposition, if any, will testify second. Each side gets 10 minutes to state its case of concerns. There's not a rebuttal process, and there's not a process to reserve your time, so convey all your information to the Board of Commissioners within your 10-minute time period. <coughs> Additionally, if more than one person wishes to speak on an issue, you might want to coordinate with each other about what you're going to talk about because each side only gets 10 minutes and you don't want to cover the same information twice. Then after both sides have had their 10-minute presentation period, the Board of Commissioners will start to discuss the matter at hand. 
uh, from the discussion, uh, they may ask one or more of the speakers to come back to the front for additional information. And after that, the board will make a decision to either approve, deny, hold, or continue the matter at hand. <clears throat> Today, there are on the agenda, there's four different parts of the agenda. The first part we're going to cover is the consent agenda. And those are cases that generally don't have any public opposition and generally meet the land use plan. The second part of the agenda are the regular cases. And these are cases that the Board of Commissioners must hear uh, in order to approve or disapprove certain things within a case. The third part is the held cases. These are cases that, that the Board has heard previously but held the decision until further information could get, uh, from, uh, could get garnered from the applicant. And then the fourth part is the other business agenda. And these are cases that the Board has previously approved but they need to come back to either amend site plans or stipulations. On today's agenda, there's two cases that have, that have been withdrawn and will not be heard today. First case is rezoning case Z92, Cotton States Premier Properties, LLC. That case was withdrawn and will not be heard today. Second case is SLUP19, West Cobb Sports Complex. That case was withdrawn with prejudice and will not be heard today. Additionally, there are a number of cases on today's agenda which have been uh, continued by the staff of the Planning Commission and will not be heard today. First case is rezone case Z2, Isaacson Living Communities, LLC. That case was continued by the Planning Commission and will not be heard until the February uh, 2015 zoning cycle. Rezone case Z61, Capital City View Homes, LLC. That case was continued by the staff and will not be heard today. That case will be heard in February 2015. Rezoning case Z8601, LLC. That case was continued by the Planning Commission and will not be heard today. That case will, will also be heard in the February 2015 zoning cycle. Rezoning case Z90, Magellan Pipeline Company, LP. That case was continued uh, by the staff and will not be heard today. LUP 34, Derek W. Thomas and Teresa Thomas. That case was continued by the staff and will not be heard until the February uh, 2015 zoning cycle. LUP 37, Bonnie Phillips. That case was continued by the staff and will not be heard until the February 2015 zoning cycle. SLEP 14, Municipal Communications, LLC. That case was continued uh, by the staff and will not be heard today. That case will be heard in the February 2015 zoning cycle. SLEP 21, Barry Wood. That case was continued by the staff and will not be heard until the February uh, 2015 zoning cycle. SLEP 22, Magellan Pipeline Company, LP. That case was continued by the staff, will not be heard until the February 2015 zoning cycle. SLUP 23, Zach Freshner, CESO Inc. That case was continued by the staff and will not be heard until the February 2015 zoning cycle. Mr. Chairman and Board, I've had a request for three other continuances that need Board votes. Uh, the applicant for rezoning, rezoning case Z87, uh, Augustina Onyek. Uh, is trying to hire an attorney, Mr. Chairman, and he need, he needs to continue that case until the February 2015 zoning cycle. And I'll bring forward a motion to continue Z87 to February zoning cycle. Is there a second? Set. Any comments? Call the question. <laughs> motion carries 4-0. As referenced earlier, Cupid is absent today. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Chairman, uh, there has been a request to also continue uh, other business item number 35, North Atlanta Soccer Association. Uh, they are continuing to work with the, the neighbors that need additional time. So if we can get a board vote to continue that till February. Motion, great motion to continue. Second. Any comments? Call the question. Motion carries 4-0. Thank you. Uh, lastly, um, other business item number 67, Enclave Cripple Creek, uh, Cripple Creek, was continued by the Board of Commissioners until the February 2015 zoning cycle. So other business item number 67 will not be heard today. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm ready to start the consent agenda. Thank you. And after that, Mr. Chairman, there's been a request for an early head count. I guess let's go ahead and do that first. Sure. Can I get a show of people here who are opposed to rezoning case Z91, Tangle Development, Inc.? Please raise your hands. Let the record show there are six people here opposed to rezoning case Z91, Tangwood Development Incorporated. Thank you. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm ready to start the consent agenda. Please. Cobb County Board of Commissioners, zoning hearing consent agenda for De December 16, 2014. 
The zoning case Z89. Ken Aaronhold request a variant uh, request a rezoning from GC to LRO for the purpose of a dental office in land lot 595 of the 16th district. The property is located on the northeast side of Kinjack Drive, west of Sandy Plains Road. The Planning Commission recommends approval to the LRO zoning district, subject to the following conditions. Site plan received by the Zoning Division on October 2nd, 2014, with the District Commissioner approving minor modifications. Uh, proposed building addition to match the existing structure and materials and architecture. Landscape buffer to be approved by the County Arborist. Fire Department comments and recommendations. Water and Sewer Division comments and recommendations. Stormwater Management Division comments and recommendations. And Cobb DOT comments and recommendations. Is the applicant present? Let the record show the applicant is present. Is there anyone here opposed rezoning case Z89? Let the record show there's no one opposed. Rezoning case Z93, Good Samaritan Health Center of Cobb Incorporated. Request rezoning from GC to CRC for the purpose of flex office space, uh, uh, educational instructional space, and a potential retail component, which may be a pharmacy or apothecary. In land lot 208 of the 17th district, the property is located on, at, at the north intersection of Austell Road and Roberta Drive. The Planning Commission recommends approval to the CRC Zoning District, subject, subject to the following conditions. Site plan received by the Zoning Division on October 6, 2014, with the District Commissioner approving minor modifications. Letter of agreeable conditions from Mr. Garris L. Sams, Jr., dated November 18, 2014, not otherwise in conflict with these conditions. Uh, allowance of uses are offices, retail use as a pharmacy, and educational or instructional use. District Commissioner shall have the authority to approve minor modifications as the development uh, proposal proceeds through plan review and thereafter, except those that increase the density of the site, uh, those that reduce the approved buffers adjacent to properties uh, with the same or more restrictive zoning category, re uh, relocate a structure closer to the same or more to, wait, excuse me, re relocate a structure uh, closer to the property line of, a, of an adjacent property that is zoned in the same or more restrictive zoning. Uh, increase the building height that is adjacent to a property that is zoned in the same or more restrictive zoning category. And change the access locations to a different roadway. Uh, Water and Sewer Division comments and recommendations. Stormwater Management Division comments and recommendations. Cobb DOT comments and recommendations. The applicant's representative is present. Is there anyone here opposed to rezoning case Z93? We have to record so there's no one opposed. And moving into land use permits on the consent agenda, LUP 36, Stacy Aspie requests a land use permit for the purpose of a cattery uh, and pet dealer in land lot 375 of the 16th district. The property is located on the northerly side of Shadowwood Trail, west of Shadowwood Court. The Planning Commission recommends approval of the land use permit for 12 months, subject to the following conditions. Approval is for the purpose of rehoming the existing cats only, no employees, no signs, no outdoor storage associated with the cattery and pet dealer activities, and no rescue operations for cats or other animals. Is the applicant present? Let the record show the applicant is present. Is there anyone here opposed to LUP 36? <coughs> Let the record show there's no one opposed, and that completes the consent agenda, Mr. Chairman and Board. Thank you. Um, yes, Commissioner Burrow. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I would like to ask a question on lot 36 of Mr. Peterson, and I would also like to recuse myself from Z89 as that is my dentist's office. Um, for lot 36, will code enforcement do an inspection at the end of the 12-month land uh, use permit? Uh, Commissioner Burrow, uh, code enforcement will go out there in 12 months and make sure that all the conditions are met and the cats that are supposed to be gone are gone. Okay, and she's in compliance. Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. I'd just like to add that on the consent. Thank um, you. And I'll be recusing myself from Z89. Thank you, so I'll bring forward a motion that we approve the consent agenda as presented with the note that Commissioner Burrow is recusing herself on Z89 as this is her personal dentist. Is there a second? Second. Any comments? Call a question. Motion carries 4-0. Thank you. Regular cases. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Rezoning case Z82, Kroger Company, requests rezoning from PSC and R20 to CRC for the purpose of uh, adding a fuel center to the existing Kroger Center and land lots 467, 468, 469, and 470 of the 16th District. 
The property is located on the south side of Shallowford Road and on the east side of Johnson's Ferry Road. The applicant's representative is present. Is there anyone here opposed to rezoning case Z80T? Please raise your hand. Let the record show there's one person opposed. All those wishing to address the board, please come forward to be sworn in. Good morning, Mr. Sams. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Um, for the record, my name is Garvis Sams, and I'm with the law firm of Sams, Lark, and Huff and & Bally, and represent Kroger, which is the applicant, and also Branch Properties, which is the uh, property owner concerning this application for rezoning. <clears throat> I have representative of, uh, of Kroger here today, and of course, of Branch Properties. We also have uh, Abdul Amir of A&R Engineering, who's our traffic consultant, and Harold Schreibman of Paulson Mitchell. Uh, who is the, the civil engineer on the site. So I think we'll have it covered all the way around with respect to questions that need to be answered uh, and uh, issues that may need to be resolved. This is an application that was heard and unanimously recommended for approval uh, by the Planning Commission with uh, the same gentleman in opposition who owns the BP station across from Johnson Ferry Road. Um, at that time, um, and now as well, uh, in addition to the Planning Commission's recommendation for approval, we have staffs recommendation for approval. We have the East Cobb Civic Association's recommendation, uh, written recommendation of approval. And just uh, for your information, we also have um, the uh, support of uh, Brooks Chadwick, which is developing the 14-acre tract, which is um, east of the, uh, of the Kroger Shopping Center. The property at issue shown here, this is an approximate 14-acre tract located on the south side of Shalford Road, east of Johnson Ferry Road, as you can see. Uh, this is Shallowford uh, Falls Shopping Center. Been here for quite some time. Uh, it was zoned actually in 1979 by virtue of a, of a settlement of litigation uh, out of a, emanated out of a zoning case. And at that time, when it was rezoned, it was rezoned to the PSC classification, which you know you have phased out. Hence, our request that it be rezoned to CRC. Um, since I've come into play in, in the application, we've revised the application so it's not only a rezoning to CRC, but also to maintain the R20 strip that's on the, the eastern side of the property that's 50 feet in width that was uh, put there with the original uh, rezoning uh, pursuant to the uh, settlement of litigation back in 1979. Uh, the reason we want the uh, CRC application is to, to give the shopping center an opportunity to grow in a, in a conservative fashion. Right now, the, the anchor Kroger's at 55,000 some change. They see ultimately they may want to, to grow, and, and there's a 70,000 square foot cap limit under, under NRC. Uh, and then there's 140,000 cap on the retail center itself. And right now we're at 103, 104,000 uh, square feet. Uh, as I mentioned, staff has recommended approval. We, uh, of course, have a number of stipulations and conditions, a couple of which I've already mentioned. Um, we've handed out to you. Um, renderings and elevations depicting the fuel center. That's what we're asking for in connection with the rezoning. It's located, as you can see there, adjacent to uh, Shalford Road. This has seven fueling stations. It's a 176 square foot kiosk that's manned by an employee. There's one restroom inside the facility for the employee's use only. Uh, as far as uh, retail, there's, there's chips, uh, candy bars, Coca Cola's, um, uh, tobacco products. Other than that, that's nothing else is sold there uh, at, the, at the kiosk. Uh, the kiosk, in, in addition to the seven fueling stations, uh, there'll also be an EV charging station for those of you who are uh, greener than, than I. Um, actually, the, the way that the, the prototypical setup uh, and the industry standard for this indicates more than seven is really be an appropriate site for nine fueling stations. The um, 
The fuel station will have lighting consistent with the photometric plan that we've also handed out to you and have submitted to uh, staff. And except for one security light under the canopy, once it closes down at 11 o'clock, it, it, all the lights go off except for that one security light. The signage, you also have photographs, or excuse me, renderings and elevations of. This will be new uh, signage. It'll be placed on Shalford and Johnson Ferry Road to incorporate the fuel center component in that. The, the signage does meet with the Cobb County sign ordinance uh, requirements uh, with respect to size, uh, shape, and of course the architectural style that is consistent with the architectural style and composition of the, of the shopping center. Um, we've also handed out to you a, a photograph of a, of a similar fueling center so you can get an idea what it looks like from the, from the outside in addition to the architectural elevation that we submitted as well. During the past four years, Kroger has added over 40 fuel stations uh, to their stores, um, so they have vast experience in this, but we thought it best uh, in view of the fact that we're asking for a contemporaneous variance with respect to the, the loss of 66 parking spaces to make sure we did a traffic analysis uh, on this. Um, if you look at the traffic analysis, hopefully you've had an opportunity before now. It was submitted, obviously, before now. You'll see that even at peak, this, this shopping center, uh, the, the most it ever has in this parking lot, even at peak, is just a little more than half full in terms of the parking actually utilized. The parking ratios that, that will now be utilized in the shopping center for the Kroger are, are highly acceptable in terms of uh, operational expertise that Kroger has. So, um, but, but again, uh, I will leave the... Um, the specifics of the parking minutia to Mr. Amir if you ask him to come forward. The landscaping will have will be consistent with uh, the landscaping that's there. There is a, um, on the eastern side, and that's what you're looking at, the eastern side is actually um, oriented north on, on this monitor. But the eastern side has, he it's a heavily landscaped R20 strip. It'll stay that way. There's a little bit of a gap where the uh, detention pond is and also where the detention pond for the Brooks Chadwick development will be in place, so we'll be redensifying, if that's a word, the, the vegetation in that part of the uh, property subject to the arborists' um, review and approval. Uh, with our discussions with ECCA, they've asked us to eliminate a number of other uses that aren't already eliminated on the lease, and you'll see that under number 17 of the, um, of the stipulation letter. So with that being said, Mr. Chairman, we do ask that you follow the recommendations of your staff, of the Planning Commission, of the ECCA. Uh, and with the support of Brooks Chadwick, and we ask it to be approved as, as we've presented it today. Mr. Schreibman from Paulson Mitchell, uh, Mr. Ramirez from A&R Engineering, uh, my clients from Kroger and from Branch, we're all available to respond to any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Opposition, please. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. My name is Jonathan Kushner. With the, I'm the owner of the BP. Okay, Jonathan, I'm, I'm sorry. Could you spell your last name for the clerk, please? Sure. K-H-O-S-H, N as Nancy, O-O, D as in David. Thank you, sir. Look, I'm the owner of the clerk, uh, Johnson Ferry and Shadow on the corner of the BP gas station. Um, I do have a deep interest in that corner lot. Uh, when, we, when, when I did on 2007, when I did my due diligence, there was about uh, 30,000 cars on Shallowford. 25, I'm sorry, 25,000 cars on Shallowford and 30,000 cars on Johnson Ferry. And from, from what I remember in December 2nd, uh, when we came for the meeting here, it was said that the traffic count was the same. So my question was that how come the traffic count from 2007 up to now has not changed at all? That's about eight years. I've been there almost eight years, so I feel like I am kind of part of the community there. The other issue I have is the, basically for the, for the other than the traffic, I was able to get about 30 pages of petitions signed that I made copies for everybody that they do oppose people in the neighborhood, they do oppose uh, for, the, for the Kroger to open a fuel station across the street, if you like to look at the copies. If you would hand them to the clerk, please. Okay. 
As for, as for the parking lot concern, from what I studied, when I was uh, able to study um, in the application zone, I did try to, to have a, pre a lawyer present me, but unfortunately, <laughs> none of the lawyers seemed to want to do a, 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 a opposition a case. So I am not a lawyer, but from what I studied at the, at the application zoning, I was able to figure out the zoning for the NCRC is, is, doesn't seem to be consistent with the future land use of NAC. And as for the parking lot, when you, when you study parking lot analysis, I noticed that it requires 455 parking for them to be in compliance. To do away with 66 parking, it doesn't say anywhere in the application that how much traffic would it acquire if they do, once the seven uh, pumps are there, how much extra traffic would it require? It, doesn't say, it does not say that. And it just says that basically what it says is the peak hours, how many parkings are parked there, and non-peak hours, how many parks are parked there. I do also have a copy of the traffic count which was done by the Department of Transportation in 2006. 12,000 cars approximately on Shallowford, 21,000 cars approximately on Johnson Ferry. 2007, which I did the due diligence before I bought the property, uh, as I said, the Johnson Ferry had 30,000 cars and 25,000 cars on uh, Shallowford. I do also have copies of these that I made from the Department of Transportation. <coughs> with that, uh, Your Honor, basically, uh, we asked with all the petitions that we had people sign, and just in the last three, three days, I had about 30 pages. It's almost about 300 people that have signed in the last three pages that I thought petition would be able, you know, just to ask the community what they think about this. Are they for it, or am I the only one who's the, excuse my French, the nutcase in this, in this, in this case? With that, we asked if, if they would consider for, for, uh, for the, Kroger not to open a fuel station that, in that place. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any other folks wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing, here, seeing and hearing none, the public comment period is closed. Uh, Commissioner Burrell, please. Thank you. Um, First of all, I'd like to make a few points and then I'm going to ask um, Jane Strickland to come up. Um, I guess first I would need to ask uh, Mr. Sams if Mr. Abdul Amir is here for the traffic study. Okay, I didn't see you, sir. Sorry. Thank you. Um, this is a area of traffic and congestion with Johnson Ferry, Shallowford, and, and um, this area with a lot of residential and commercial. And uh, I think the existing conditions are such that um, with the existing shopping center there now um, adding the fuel center is yeah, I'd like to ask the applicant what they think um, adding that to the store would do as far as increase in customers and traffic. Um, but the shopping center is based on the traffic study um, on the busiest days or is not, the parking is not half full. And they are seeking a variance um, for the number of required spaces. And it's my understanding too that this shopping center is, with the exception of two or three smaller retail spaces, is pretty much at capacity um, in the shopping center stores. And you may want to speak to that, the uh, shopping center owners may want to speak to that as well. Um, Mr. I mean, Jane, would you come up? I 
deity. Thanks, Jane. You and I visited the site and um, looked at a lot of different scenarios of uh, traffic in and out um, from Shaliford from the two access points on either side of where the fuel station will be located. Right. Um, and that will remain right turn in on both sides of that. Yes, ma'am. And um, we also looked at a request for moving the station up closer, but um, to the wall area. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a letter dated November, uh, December 11th from Mr. Sams uh, stating the reasons why that's not feasible for Kroger to do. Um, but you also um, mentioned that relocating the pumps within the shopping center wouldn't really affect the traffic flow. Um, but if right. you could just address the entrance for off Shaliford and if there's any um, <clears throat> chance or um, any way that it would be the traffic would be stacked or queued to get into the fuel pumps from that location. Right. We would ask that, per the development standards, that there be a hundred foot of uninterrupted access, meaning that from Shallowford Road, you would have to have a minimum of a hundred feet before there would be the access into the to the pumps, which I believe they meet it with their current plan. Right, because the the um, opening for the entrance to the fuel pumps is at least a hundred feet from Shallowford. Yes. Okay, so that's sufficient for? Yes, it provides enough queuing or stacking for, so vehicles aren't trapped on Shallowford Road trying to come into the site. Right, and we also considered reducing the number of pumps from seven to five, um, but then looking at that, we think that that would create more uh, congestion and traffic getting in and out without the number of, of pumps there for accessibility. And, um, and space. And that would add about 12 or 14 parking spaces, but you know, if the center is not at capacity on any given day, on the busiest days, um, you know, it may not be necessary. But we did consider all of that. Okay. So um, you've looked at the traffic study that was provided um, December 8th? Yes. Okay. And they meet the requirements of the 100 foot and um, you're in agreement with this? Yes, okay. ma'am. Thank you. All right, thanks. Do y'all have any? Yeah, Jane, before you go, um, some, of the, some of the comments that I received is because of the age of this particular subdivision, some, or this, uh, this shopping center, some of the current landscape may have grown to a point where it's obstructing site view. Did you guys look at that yet, or will you do that in the process of plan review? Um, no, but we will. Okay. I'll, I'll personally go out there and look at it and make All sure right. that it's not obstructing the site. I'd appreciate that. And the other comment is that folks, for some reason, um, although it's two right in, right out, lane, two right in, right out entrances off Shallowford, mm -hmm. there's the occasional person that has the death wish of trying to turn left or go straight across. <laughs> um, would pork chops benefit guiding people to where they need to go yes. or some other kind of traffic calming device that would make it clear that the, that the only option that's safe is to make a right turn out of there as opposed to trying to go across the street or turn left to yes, head west. Would you look at all those mm -hmm. um, issues? I think those are valid concerns. 
regardless of whether or not this gets approved, I think those are valid concerns for those two particular entrances since they're so close to each other and yeah. given what's going on there. Right, because right now it's just a sign saying no left turn. Right. Correct, which is a lot of people think STOP spells hesitate too. So we just want to make sure we get as much persuasion to do the right thing as possible within reason. And that will be determined in plan review? Yeah. Okay. okay. And there is sidewalks along there, correct? Yes, yes sir. Would the, and this is a recommendation, Mr. Sams, you may want to consider um, how you're going to get pedestrian traffic from the sidewalks into your shopping center it's, since you're doing a lot around it. If, if this gets approved, you may want to consider a pedestrian plan for the entire shopping center. Thank you, Jane. No, we, Thank you, Jane. We have considered that and, and have taken a look at that. There's a nine foot or nine degree slope coming off of Shalford down to the shopping center. So there, there are some problematic aspects of that, but we, we're looking at that and that'll be a function of plan review as well. Mr. Sure. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. That's all my questions. Okay. Um, and also in your letter dated November 21st, um, I believe it's number 17 with the uh, non-acceptable uses. We'd also like to add um, no use car sales. And I think the applicant's agreeable to that. Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor, would you like to come up and go over your traffic study? And I'd also like to submit the traffic study with the letter December 8th from Mr. Sams um, for the record as well. Good morning. My name is Abdul Amir. I'm a traffic engineer with ANR Engineering. I was asked to do a traffic study and a parking study um, for this project. It was uh, completed and submitted to Cobb County for review. Um, the summary for parking was already mentioned. Uh, in the existing condition, the parking uh, occupied, number of occupied parking spaces in the shopping center during the weekday as well as during Saturday was close to 50%. Um, approximately half the parking spaces were still unutilized and specifically the area where the fuel center is proposed, um, we found only 25% of the park, those parking spaces being utilized. So from standpoint of placing a fuel center in the best place, uh, from a parking standpoint, that is relatively, um, unused area in the parking lot. And um, after we projected um, the 66 spaces removed and, and the occupancy, we still have um, on a Saturday, uh, which is the most utilized day, uh, 59, 50, um, let me see, 59% of the remainder of the spaces will be occupied. So after the field center is um, located and the 66 parking spaces are lost, you just utilize, if you just look at the front parking spaces, 59% uh, of those spaces will be occupied. So there will still be plenty of uh, vacant spaces for those shoppers coming in to circulate around and find conveniently find a parking space. I believe this study is very conservative uh, for several reasons. Uh, there, are, there are a number of parking spaces in the rear of the um, shopping center building that um, currently is utilized to 11% um, occupancy rate. So 90% of the spaces in the back are not utilized. Employees could park there and things like that. But because those spaces are inconvenient for um, shopping center patrons, we totally excluded that as if they're not there. But there are those additional spaces in the back, which we have not included in the analysis results I'm reporting today. Uh, from a traffic standpoint, as you know, there are five access points to the shopping center. And um, that provides plenty of opportunities for entering and exiting traffic to um, use any of these driveways, one of which is signalized, uh, as you know. And um, the traffic study that was submitted does include projections of traffic that this field center will uh, generate. Um, as in any field center, um, majority of the traffic 
almost 50 percent, 50 to 60 percent of the traffic is passed by traffic. That is traffic that's already <coughs> on the road, uh, driving to another destination that pulls in to fill up gas and go. And, and in a fuel center associated with Kroger, um, it is specially the, it, specifically um, there are additional tri uh, reduced trips because of the mixed use nature. People who come to uh, do grocery shopping will also uh, fuel up. So these are not trips that are customers that are going in the field center are not necessarily all new trips coming from home to come to field center to fuel up and go. They're either driving down the road or they're coming in the shopping center to shop in the grocery store decide to fuel up. So a lot of the trips uh, that this field center will uh, generate are really already there on the road in the parking lot. Uh, the study does include estimates of trip generation. Uh, I think the gentleman who was in opposition probably did not see that or didn't have a copy of my study, but it does include estimates. We are projecting um, 30 to 40 cars an hour as new trips. That is not including in a peak hour. That's not including any mixed use reductions because of the grocery store. If this were just a regular fuel center, uh, including the pass by trips, we are talking about 30 to 40 cars in an hour. Now, that is one car every two minutes. And then you take into account five driveways and then the directions, different directions they come from. You may be talking about one car every four or five minutes on each of these driveways as a new trip. Um, so that kind of shows that the minimum impact, uh, the nature of the minimal impact because of this uh, field center, proposed field center on adjacent streets. Uh, I do believe, like Jane Strickland pointed out, that uh, once we provide adequate throat and um, internal parking circulation will uh, continue to operate satisfactorily. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Do you have any further questions? I don't have any Thank you, sir. Questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, and um, also like to point out that the, um, well, first of all, staff is, the applicant has asked for CRC zoning, rezoning, um, and staff is recommending NRC um, as that is more suitable for the use and development of the adjacent nearby properties. Um, and I'd also like to point out that this, the R20 strip on the Easter, easterly side of the shopping center um, will remain intact, which is a, a 50 foot setback and a 40 foot landscape buffer in that R20 strip. So that will remain with the um, zoning. Did anyone else have any other questions? Uh, or? Yeah, if you would, Mr. Sands could, Kroger's the applicant. Do they own the shopping center? No, some by Shallowford Falls LLC, which is one of the many uh, branches of, no pun intended, branch properties. Okay, so. Kroger's the largest, the largest tenant. And they're obviously authorized on behalf of LLC or Shallowford to come forward with this change of their Yes, sir. Shallowford, uh, of course, had to, had to sign the application as the property owner. And I've got a representative of Shallowford slash branch Mr. Brett Horowitz here with me today if you've got any questions okay. about that. I want you to entertain me for a moment here. Uh, it's, it's close to Christmas and it's a slow day and it's Helen's second to last day or last zoning day. Um, Kroger's obviously making an investment in their stores by a product expansion. Um, I don't think anybody ever would have thought that grocery stores would ever have fuel stores or that fuel stores, whatever, become grocery stores, as some of our fuel stations are becoming more and more full service. So we've had an evolution in regard to how business is, and I understand the need to do that. I also wonder, you know, occasionally Kroger will close the store. 
when market demands come through and they decide they want to either relocate for a larger facility or a smaller facility or make it a specialized store. Um, and I can, can imagine, although Shellifer Falls is going into his eyes wide open, that if Kroger ever decided to close the store, even though they may have lease obligations, we might have a shopping center with a closed Kroger store with an active shopping center while Shelford Falls tried to find another tenant. And we've had a similar situation, similar, very similar to that just up the street on Sandy Plains and Shelford where a, a grocery store was closed and it remains dark. Although the lease is active and there's payments going on, it remains, it remains dark. Um, is it too much to ask Kroger that if they decided to abandon this store, either through closure or to permanently leave and under Shelfer Falls agreement, that they, um, unless they have their next tenant takes over this fueling station, they remediate to remove it and remediate tanks to the to pre-existing or to whatever governing body uh, decides whether or not a, a site's been re remediated, so we don't have in the in the in the the event Kroger's business model changes and they decide to move, is it, do you think that would be an option that they would want to consider? It would be, and, and, and that, that really kind of dovetails into another topic, um, and that is Kroger needs the ability to be able to, to expand. They, they, they don't know when or, or if that will happen, but right now they're at 55,000 and change. They anticipate going up to 70 plus thousand you know the, the Kroger marketplaces are around a hundred thousand square feet the, the larger superstores mm -hmm. they're not going to get that big they need the latitude to do that in the CRC moreover mm -hmm. Shallowford Falls the, the property owner needs the latitude because if Kroger somehow or another or they got at loggerheads over a lease issue and Kroger did leave and then remediated as, as you have suggested that they do with respect to the fuel center and the USTs Shallowford Falls will be left with a, a 60 thousand square foot space probably and under the NRC classification uh, there's a max of, of uh, junior anchors uh, can exceed 20,000 square feet so that explains another reason why Shallowford Falls and Kroger from a two-pronged perspective it just happened to be an unintended uh, dual consequence that they both need the CRC for for survival and <clears throat> as I mentioned conservative growth in the future but to get back to your original question the answer is yes okay well, I appreciate that um, but to, to your last point, the commissioner was mentioned that the staff had recommended NRC. the NRC to be compliant or be compatible with across the street versus the CRC. If, if she were to follow staff's recommendation as opposed to recommendation from planning, where does that leave us? Well, and I think if you ask uh, Mr. Peterson, he'll tell you that he's constrained to follow the dictates of the NAC as shown on the future land use map. but. From a staff or land use planning perspective, he really has no pushback or heartburn over this being rezoned to CRC. Okay. If you Sorry. would ask him that. Yeah. If, <laughs> Mr. Peterson. Uh, Mr. We Chairman, don't want to give you any heartburn. So. Mr. Chairman, the way Mr. Sam's uh, phrased it is correct. You know, we, we were limited by the land use plan to recommend NRC, but I have no heartburn over CRC because that's what the Walmart next door is owned. Got it. Understood. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank Any you, questions sir. for Mr. Sams? Thanks, sir. Thank you, Commissioner, for indulging me. Thank you. Okay. Okay, and um, I, I also w just want to point out Mr. Sams did meet with um, neighborhood HOAs in the area and um, spoke with them. And it, uh, there were a couple of individual uh, letters and op emails in opposition uh, that we received and um, I did sp speak with Jonathan in length um, I was at his store he was on the phone with me and um, I'm I understand he uh, was denied a zoning but for a different use and um, He's in a much smaller space than the shopping center, so. But I am gonna be meeting with him after the first of the year to see what his concerns are for um, 
for his store. So um, I think I'm ready to make a motion sure. unless there are any other comments or questions from the board. Please. Um, I would like to make a motion to approve Z82, deleting it to CRC. Right, approving it. Okay, approval of Z82 to CRC, um, subject to the letter of agreeable conditions from Mr. Sams, dated November 21st, December 8th. Um, with the traffic study December 11th letter and um, also the December 1st letters. I guess I need to put those in sequence, but the clerk will do that. Um, also that the R20 strip remain intact. Uh, the the uh, traffic study which is the letter dated December 8th, um, and add no used car sales to number 17, and um, if the uh, Kroger ever terminates their lease or uh, moves out of Shaliford Falls Shopping Center that they will return the fuel tanks and back to its um, to parking spaces and remediate those. And then the other staff comments um, that will go through plan review. And Planning Commission, staff comments not otherwise in conflict. Okay, and then um, just a second your motion for the purpose of discussion. I'd like to add that during traffic or during um, plan review that there'll be a specific emphasis put on the issues of, of site distance, um, traffic, ingress and egress, and sidewalk and pedestrian friendly um, access okay. to be reviewed and, and by DLT for their, their particular uh, recommendations for that. So we have a motion and a second. Um, and, yes. And the final, final site plan to come back to the district commissioner for approval. Okay, that'll be added. Final site plan approval to the district commissioner. We have a motion and a second. Is there any comments on the board? Commissioner Ott. Um, thank you, Commissioner Burrell, for um, <clears throat> going over the items you did. Um, I still have the concerns that we just talked about yesterday. Any other comments? Call the question. Motion carries 3-1. Commissioner Ott in opposition. Thank you. So that takes us next to Z88. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Rezoning case Z88, Moulton Lake LLC, request rezoning from R20 to RSL for the purpose of a residential senior non-supportive subdivision in landlot 57 of the 20th district. The property is located on the north side of Wooten Lake Road, west of Shiloh Road. The applicant's representative is present. Is there anyone here opposed to rezoning case Z88? Please keep your hands raised. Let the record show there are seven people here opposed to rezoning case Z88. All those wishing to address the board, please come forward to be sworn in.
Mr. Sams, good morning. Good morning again, Mr. Chairman. For the, uh, for the record, my name is Garber Sams. I'm a, a partner with the law firm of Sams, Lark, and Huff and & Bally and uh, represent Wooten Lake LLC concerning this uh, application for rezoning. I have uh, with me today Mr. Brian Wall and Mr. Greg Wall of, uh, of Envision, uh, which is also Wooten Lake LLC or one of its offshoots. Um, and also uh, today, Mr. Amir, who was the engineer on the last project, it was the engineer on this project as well. So, so he's here to respond to any questions or address any concerns you may have from a traffic or transportational perspective. This was uh, an application uh, that was heard, considered, and uh, unanimously recommended for approval by the, uh, the Planning Commission following staff's recommendation for approval two weeks ago. The property at issue that's uh, being shown on your monitors here, this is almost a 22-acre track, 21.984 acres, which is located, as you can see, on the north side of Wooten Lake Road, just west of Shiloh Road. Um, it's, of course, on the future land use map uh, for low-density residential. Uh, recently, uh, or fairly recently, the ordinance has been amended uh, with respect to non-supportive RSLs to allow them to occur in LDR areas as long as they don't exceed the, uh, the, uh, the density of the zoning district, uh, and also to allow um, RSLs uh, along uh, major collectors as well as, as arterials, which, of course, Wooten Lake is. Um, your professional staff has recommended approval of this application, specifically what the applicant is, is proposing and um, is probably the most unique, uh, most cutting edge, active life RSL community that, that you have ever seen um, in either Commissioner Burrell's district or in any part of, of Cobb County or any part of the state of Georgia so far. And they seek to rezone this from R20 to RSL for the purposes of creating an amenity rich um, like-minded um, enclave for affinity groups, meaning it doesn't just mean old people that like the same things. It, it means offering uh, a, a lot of activities, a, a lot of things that RSLs typically don't uh, don't offer. Uh, I've handed out to you the conceptual architectural styles of the homes, um, and you'll get an idea with the next slide that's, that's coming up. Um, the other parts of the um, subdivision that, that has some very distinct features such as the inordinate amount of open space the, that we've got which puts us down to a position so we're at approximately 45 percent um, impervious whereas the maximum allowed at RSL is 55. You can see we have an inordinate amount of uh, common space as well. You can see the streetscapes are, are certainly unique in, in terms of the, the creativeness of those. And then the, uh, the house styles, which will be the, the next slide, uh, are varied. You've got everything from trish, traditional to uh, neo-traditional to um, sort of a cottage type of uh, process as, as well. And, um, and those will be organized in, in various sectors of the, uh, of the subdivision to, to give the, the flavor of the European cottage traditional French country, and of course the farmhouse, as you see as well. You've got those elevations, those renderings in front of you as well. We, we've ha been able to establish an excellent dialogue with uh, Comp County professional staff and with members of the, uh, of the public. Uh, Brian and Greg Wall have, have, have done the, the yeoman's work in connection with that, meeting with all the contiguous subdivisions to bring them up to space, or rather up to speed, uh, on the, the various components of this. It includes um, health and wellness, of course, lifelong learning in terms of uh, a potential um, hand-in-glove aspect with, with other learning facilities in the area, socialization, and of course volunteerism and, and civic engagement as well. In looking at the site plan that you saw at the, at the beginning, you, you see the clubhouse that we have is almost four times the size of any clubhouse in any traditional RSL community that you have in uh, Cobb County, and it's in order to be able to incorporate uh, this lifestyle inspiration board that you're, that you're seeing here uh, right now. Um, based upon our discussions and discussions with staff and members of the public and the Planning Commission, we, we submitted a letter of agreeable stipulations on November the 13th, and as of the day before the Planning Commission hearing, uh, we presented uh, an additional um, stipulation letter. And what was covered then had to do, apparently there is a subdivision in the, in the area that's talking about going uh, to more of a rental component and is asking for an increase. We have submitted a letter uh, on December the 1st 
that limits the the potential leasing of any of these um, homes to 10% at any one time. And that is not only going to be a stipulation of zoning, which runs with the property, but also in the covenants, conditions, and restrictions, which will be recorded on the deed records and will also run with the property. So they're not only enforceable, um, they, they are enforceable by either you as the county or the HOA as the, uh, as the <coughs> governing body of the subdivision itself. We've also, uh, on December the, the 9th, we revised the site plan. If you can go back to the site. And what we did there, we'd originally asked for a, some relief on the perimeter a buffer. Uh, as you know, there's a 20-foot landscape perimeter buffer uh, that goes around the property. Originally, we had some rear-loaded project on the northern end of the property near Arnold Lake subdivision. We've uh, revised the site plan, so we're not asking for any relief from that buffer. In fact, um, the entirety of the project has that, so we're not asking for that as a variance. Moreover, we submitted also uh, on December the 9th the landscape plan that, that uh, determines and delineates every single uh, bit of vegetation, trees, landscaping that will go into that buffer, of course, subject to your arborist review and approval. But nevertheless, it answers uh, two of the questions that were raised at the, uh, at the planning commission level. And also another stipulation that went in the original November letter is that uh, we've agreed to a reversion of this um, to the R20 classification if within 24 months of the date of the issuance of the land disturbance permit, uh, either uh, Wooten Lake hasn't closed on it or one of its entities, um, or um, if uh, development has not commenced. Um, with respect to the stipulations that are in existence prior to those uh, differences being made, if, if, if you are familiar with the area, you know that there's a multiplicity of zonings in this area, all the way from RA6s to RA4s to R20s, to PD, which is a plan development, to fee simple townhomes, to uh, also uh, an OMR, which is an office mid-rise as well. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting um, evolution of a mixed bag of different zonings. And what we've done is, is created a more of a continuity, not with the mixed bag aspect, but with the, the single family uh, aspect that we think is, is more appropriate for this, for this area. The total site is 21.98 acres. Approximately 45% of this will be uh, impervious, well below the 55% allowed into RSL. The house sizes will range from 1,600 square feet up to 2,800 square feet. Price points, and I know this isn't a stipulation, but to give you an idea of the, of the wide range of product we have, the price points will range from 260000 to uh, 450000 with upgrades generally running about 12 to 15%, depending upon the individual tastes of the uh, of the 55 year of age and, and older um, individuals buying this. Architectural style and composition, we've agreed to, to what you have in front of you, what you've seen on the monitors and what you have that's been given out. Um, subdivision entrance signage that will be on Wooten Lake Road will be ground-based monument style signage. We have left ourselves with the option of having this as a gated community by virtue of the streets that we have, which will be private streets, but built to the county's design and detail specifications. In fact, we've had um, Chief Westbrook out there on the site to, to look at the, at the entrance. We exceed, vastly exceed site distance in both directions on Wooten Lay Road, either under its present 35 mile per hour speed limit or under a 45 mile per hour speed limit. Getting back to Chief Westbrook, he was looking at the turning radii within the subdivision, parking, uh, and if we had adequate parking, and, and of course the configuration of the streets and the positioning of the entrance you see on Wooten Lay Road. The, um, the water system, um, we've agreed to, to master meter and also sub-meter each house to, uh, to ensure that we, we track the water usage and, and able to undertake conservation measures um, from an individual's perspective. We've agreed to all the stormwater management comments and recommendations, and, and those comments and recommendations, by the way, have been revised. I don't know if you've seen those or not, but Mr. Braden revised those recently in the past week. You should have those. There's one lake downstream, Chestnut Hill Lake, located about 2,000 yards downstream. We'll be doing pre and post studies on that. We've agreed to everything DOT has, has asked for. I'm running out of time. That's the reason I'm sort of going a little more swiftly on that part of it. But sidewalk, curb, and gutter, of course. Um, private streets, if applicable, built to the county's design and detail specifications. There may be a situation that's called for with respect to a left turning lane, and if that turns out to be, that's a, going to be something that's determined during plan review right now because of the physical constraints and because of other 
anomalies and conditions that as a non as a non traffic engineer I'm not conversant with. I'll leave that to, to Ms. Strickland and her department, but that is their request, DOT's request, that that decision be made during plan review. Um, I'm a couple of seconds over, Mr. Chairman, so I'll wrap up by saying we, we do ask that, uh, that you approve this as your staff has recommended and approve it as your planning commission has recommended and with respect to all the stipulations and conditions to which we have agreed and what you're looking at here was the last picture. This is the communal uh, space will be used for, for picnics, concerts, and the like that's right there in the front of the subdivision. As I mentioned, the inordinate amount of green space we have enables us to be able to do that in another bird's eye view of what the configuration of the subdivision will look like. So we're here to respond to any questions. Again, Mr. Amir is, is here as our traffic consultant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Opposition, please. My name is Julia Smith, and I am a resident on Wooten Lake Road. I'm here um, largely to represent the senior citizens that live on this road that have been lifelong members for a long time. And I really appreciate all the work that's gone into this. They're, they're, the more I sit here and listen to stuff, the more complicated everything is as far as any kind of zoning. Um, I, there are concerns here with zoning being permanent, as it was discussed in the Planning Commission. And once it's passed, enforcement and all these other issues. And I, I really appreciate y'all's efforts in trying to address them. Um, there are still some major concerns with stormwater runoff and the low-lying residents who have been there for years. And they also have livestock down there that, you know, feed off the grass. And, and then, of course, you have a flood zone down there. And I just, um, I guess the... Even in the stormwater management report that was presented and sent out yesterday, you know, you're still needing permits and erosion sediment reviews and um, plans to keep residential buildings at a hazard and securing right of ways, project en engineer evaluations, uh, all this submittal and drainage easements. And so I just, you know, once you pass the zoning, how are you going to enforce anything? Um, that, that's always a question, and then I, I just, I'm not sure why we're pushing a vote of yes or no today, why it can't be postponed until some of these issues are further addressed and these residents that have been there for years and lifelong don't have some kind of confidence that they're not going to be overrun with flood water and, and, and causing problems for them. I, I just, I really just don't understand it. Um, so why can't we postpone it? I mean, it seemed as though last in the Planning Commission that they all almost wanted to vote to postpone it. And I'm sh I really feel that there's some kind of time limit of, limit of offer um, in regards to this, and that may be. Um, but if a development, you know, it looks like a fantastic development. Trust me. I mean, I, I love the looks of it. Uh, it's not about the looks and the aesthetics and you know, what ifs and what I can provide and, and, and all that. It's, it's what are you doing to <coughs> permanent residences that are already there. Is it worth passing something that you're going to detrimentally affect Cobb County residents that have been your, I mean, they have supported you for years. So I, I just don't understand. Maybe I just don't understand this, this whole process. It could be. I'm not... <laughs> You know, I, I looked at the developer side, and I know KSU and Ali are behind them. I know they're their partners, or have been at times past, if they are not now, you know. But they have on their website, they operate at the highest level of integrity and do business with those who follow the same principle. We want to succeed, but we want to succeed the right way. Is the right way pushing zoning when you have still have unanswered questions on stormwater management is my question. Um, you know, I, I would love to see the development personally. I think it's, it's an asset for our community, but I don't want it if it's going to detrimentally affect people. Uh, I am kind of partial to uh, senior citizens and them being kind of overrun. My mom has been, although she's not a Cobb County resident, you know, she's been done wrong several times. And we need to, as adults, we need to look out for our elderly and they shouldn't be adversely affected. And so I'm standing here for them. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm opposed so much to the project itself. I'm opposed to the progression of RSL because 
it is still awful broad for me. Um, I, and I know it has a proposed intent of the non-supportive non residential, but that's not really the passing, the way I look at it, it's passing with RSL. And um, so, and that's huge. It can go from eight stories to one, a one story building. I still have issues with that, even though y'all have told me in the planning that there's, um, y'all can control that. It's just, it's out there. <laughs> and, and it is different than what we have right now that's currently surrounding this area. So I would just like to see, and I think the residents would like to see a postponement until we have some more definitions as far as to the stormwater management and how it's going to affect the community that exists. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Are there in, any other speakers? I'm uh, Gilbert James, um, a resident on uh, Wooden Lake. We have a small farm that straddles Tate Creek that runs off of Wooden Lake. And um, again, my concern is the stormwater as well. Um, the county's been good enough to put in some gravel to reinforce the creek banks now because we get quite a bit of water off the subdivisions above us. There is a sewer line that runs parallel to the creek as well, and that gravel is brought in to help to reinforce that so there wouldn't be any erosion. Uh, there is a wet water creek that runs down from uh, Donnelly's, which is next to me, and from up above the hill that flows when, even when uh, we have a pretty good rain. It doesn't have to be a bad rain at all and the creek gets, uh, gets up. We also have pretty good water flow from this same area that comes down as well. Um, I've been there for, our family's been there for about 50 years. We've seen a lot of development around us. And we are in a flood plain, I understand that, but we have, we have some cows and we have a, you know, that sort of thing that I, my concern is that it's going to create a constant water issue with us as well. So it's a way of life that we've had. We would, wouldn't want to lose it um, just for the fact that the wastewater is coming down here. So that's, I want to put a little face with my uh, issue because I don't <coughs> understand the zoning laws and everything's going on, but the wastewater is a big issue for us. Thank you, sir. Any other speakers? Seeing and hearing none, the public hearing is closed. Commissioner Burrell. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I would first like to ask Mr. Sams to come up and ex or maybe um, the two brothers, my, their last names escaped me. Well, W O H L. Well, the Wolds to come up and explain your in lieu of detention pond, the, the um, plan you have in place, the environmental issues for the stormwater. Sure, I, I'll, I'll get Greg um, to come up if, if, if he could. This is Greg Well, who'll be making his way up here, Sorry. and <clears throat> either I can swear him in or. Good morning. I'm Greg Wall. Good, Good morning, Greg. Would Would you like to show us how you're going to manage the stormwater runoff? And you, normally, we're used to seeing a detention pond on site with the concrete walls and fencing and landscaping around it. We um, will have detention, but right. it's just going to be configured a little bit differently than the way that you're you're describing it. Uh, the detention area is labeled the detention area is in here and also in here there will be a small detention area at Wooten Lake Road the goal is to keep the detention um, from a from an aesthetic perspective more organic looking than a what I would describe as a traditional detention pond, which is typically just a hole uh, surrounded by concrete. Um, 
again, the, the goal is to make it more aesthetically pleasing, and um, it will function in the exact same way as a traditional detention pond will, will function. The goal, obviously, with detention is to slow down the movement of water mm -hmm. from, from impervious areas um, to where that water is being distributed to. So um, it will function the same way, and we will be working with stormwater, Cobb County stormwater, to make sure that it is designed properly. We, of course, will have a civil engineer that will design it for us. Um, it's not as if we're skirting detention um, at all. We're just designing it in such a way that it's more aesthetically pleasing. In fact, we will have, um, in this detention area, we will have walking paths that will be going through here, um, through here and also down and through here. And um, the whole goal, again, is to meet the guidelines but also make it more sustainable and more visually uh, appealing than just a, a, a concrete hole. Okay, will it be running underground with pipes? Um, or? At, at the front it will be running, it will be underground, but here it will be above ground. Um, it will likely be piped, because we have to get an easement to cross the property line here to go into the, um, the, the property next door, we will be piping it the, the, the runoff will come this way and we'll be piping it through this corner right here, down through here, and draining it, um, draining the storm water to this, to this area, which is currently floodplain area. Uh, it'll be designed to um, a 50-year floodplain instead of a 100-year floodplain. Uh, that is a request by staff. So we are, we are very sensitive to the issue, and we appreciate the, the folks in the area being sensitive to that. We, we want to be good neighbors, uh, but we want to design it in such a way that it, that it looks good and also functions properly. Uh, it, it, it would be easy to stick a, a detention pond in the corner someplace, and, and it just becomes a collection point for a bunch of stuff, and that's not what we're trying to do here. But, of course, it will be designed properly, and, and during the staff review process, um, we will be working closely with staff to make sure that it, that is insured. Okay. I, I just wanted you to kind of explain the system that you're sure, looking no at problem. doing for the, ha happy for to the do neighbors. That. Okay. Um, Thank you. That, that's all the questions I have. Do you all have any? If I, could ask, if I could ask Dave Braden to come oh. up just for a minute. Garvis, don't go far. Um, Dave. Dave Bray with Stormwater Management Division. Okay, I remember, <laughs> and I'm sure everyone else up here, well, you were Homeowners Association, you're Homeowners Association, you, you weren't, but we were all Homeowners <laughs> Association. So one of our biggest fears when we first got into this is how does this all work? And I'm going to ask you to indulge me again. Um, there's some concerns about water and storm water specifically. Um, take us through, if you would, just for the benefit of the folks that are here today, so they can get a more comfortable feeling as to how this is not just an arbitrary process as it relates to state law, development law, inspection, site plan review, uh, site inspections. What is the process? Because I think that what I heard two different, I heard of concern about compliance and a concern about um, monitoring and, and, and making sure that what's said is going to happen and the things of that nature. And, um, and I'd like for you to talk to that. Um, Gar Mr. Sams, I'm going to ask you um, if your client would be amenable, because I think this is important to do, is to do the, do the engineering before LDP is is issued if that allows you to do that um, and that easement so if you were to gain that easement that you need and the engineering for water before an LDP is that way we, we know what we're doing stormwater before we even give a, a land disturbance permit out there oh, yeah. so that we're not disturbing anything that might be preserved 
Thank, thank you. So if you would go through just some let me explain. The, let me explain the process first. Sure. We do not issue any land disturbance permits until all of the issues, site design, stormwater, are, are evaluated and approved. So mm -hmm. all of that design will have to be done before they ever would be able to be able to get Including the easements, right? Including easements, that's correct. Okay. So, um, and you're correct. There are there are minimum state laws. There's minimum district, uh, metro district stormwater management requirements, and then Cobb County's requirements are even more restrictive than than those. So, we're not waiving any of those requirements with this zoning request. They still have to meet. They can be as creative as they want to with how they design it and making it be more of an amenity than just a big detention pond hole in the corner of the site. And we would encourage that because it means that they'll, they'll be more and more inclined to maintain it. So it will still have to meet all those requirements. As far as an easement, um, they're probably going to do what they suggested because this is what we talked about in the applicant meeting before they, before they came before the Planning Commission in that they don't own all the property down to the floodplain and the stream except in the very north corner of the site. So it's much easier to take, take all of the site water run it through their stormwater management system, reduce the flows. He said to a 50-year, actually what he means is, because there are downstream drainage issues, we're requiring not only just to detain the site to the existing conditions runoff, but they're actually going to reduce it to the next storm down. So the 100, normally you'd be able to release the existing conditions, 100-year runoff, peak discharge to the 100-year existing. We're going to make them drop that down to the 50 and the 50 to 10. So there will be reduced runoff from the site. With, with, with this Versus design. what's currently there. Versus what's currently. Um, even with that reduction, you're still, you're still increasing the volume of runoff to somebody adjacent down to the stream. So they own all the way down to the stream on the northern part of the site. So it makes it a lot easier to run, discharge directly to the stream, which is where all this runoff is going already, in addition to the huge basin upstream with the upstream lake. So. Um, all of that will be addressed at, at plan review. That's correct. Is this, a, is this a pond we'll take control of, or don't we normally take control of detention ponds? Pardon, say, I was saying that question again. I'm sorry. Don't, isn't it typical with a subdivision once it's taken, once it's accepted by the county that we take responsibility for detention? Condominium developments and RSL developments are typically done, treated as like we do commercial developments. In other words, all of the open space and, infra and is maintained by the, by the HOA. Is that inspected yeah. on a yeah, regular basis? It would, it would be inspected, that's correct. Right. Okay, and then remediation. And, th and if there's issues, then, then th uh, those reports can be generated okay. and what out control structure may need to be okay. modified. Um, any commissioners got any questions, Dave? Commissioner Ross? Um, I mean, the, my following question is what you just asked about the ownership because as we all know, there's lots of stormwater issues up in that part of the county with private ownership. Um, so you answer that. Um, my question is for Rock. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm Rock. I represent the Cobb County Fire Marshal. Um, if uh, and I know that uh, Garvis said that they're doing away with the request for the variance um, for the 35 foot to 15 but is the variance still there for the 10 foot between buildings yes okay so does um is it not fire's normal policy that that restricts par uh, on street parking is it, if there's only 10 foot between buildings yes sir uh, so the yes be, parking will have to be accounted for or they'll have to uh, label the roadways as fire lanes right so then there can be no parking on the roads is that <laughs> correct <laughs> okay yeah, no, I mean, I'm just I've, asking. I've, I've seen communities that have been marked with the whole roads as fire lanes, and it's quite the sight to see nothing but red curbs throughout this whole. So that's a that's that's a decision by the developers how they want to handle that, either provide the parking or label. Right. Um, okay, so with that, Garvis, just following question. <clears throat> are, and are you not, are you, um, asking for the private streets with we provided it's in the stipulation letter 0.5 spaces per unit is is required uh as uh, mr teller told you about so that is in the stipulation letter as a part of it and we checked with chief westbrook on the site in terms of the configuration the positioning of that parking as well and he 
I can tell you he's, he signed off. So well, sign off, but so there's was. more. I mean, because um, the stuff that we got only showed the guest parking on the um, I'll just call it the common area. Yes, sir. in the very beginning. There's other guest parking throughout. Yes, sir. Okay. Commissioner Gorham. Uh, I was um, going to follow Commissioner Ott's lead regarding uh, the the parking in the ten foot between buildings. <coughs> um, just from a density standpoint. Uh, there appears there there could have been some negotiations on the density here. I I have a little bit of heartburn. It's not my district here, but this is a medium density, basically um, development in an area that's a lot of R15 and R20. Um, you know, just appears there could have been some negotiations uh, from a UPA standpoint that would could eliminate or increase the the. Uh, space between the units itself and make parking a little bit more palatable and a little bit more convenient for the residents uh, there. Uh, there's always room for negotiations regarding uh, the density on a project and, um, you know, just, just a few concerns from, from that area. You know, I know there was somewhere in that area there was a density of 4.05, but whenever there is a <clears throat> exception to the rule there is another exception to the rule and it's always in the uh, direction of increasing density in an area and another concern I might have is um, the homes that are on the back side of that uh, or the north side of, of the um, of the project and how many homes now align up against those existing homes over there but you know this uh, a reduction in density might have addressed that and made it a little bit uh, more palatable. It's not really the form of the question, but may I respond briefly to that? Sure. And in terms of density, that 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 is always on the table and it's always negotiable and it's something we looked at. We met with um, Commissioner Burrow, we met with staff long before filing this application and, and of course the board in its wisdom felt compelled to um, approve um, RSL uh, non-supportive to, to be within the confines of LDR. Uh, I mean, that's that's allowed. And then there were no limitations on, on it capping out at a, at a 2.5 unit per acre density. This is not a, a maxing out of the site. Quite the contrary. What we wanted to do was create the meaningfully positioned open space uh, that we've been able to do and do that in such a fashion so that we create the smaller footprints with the side-by-side -side courtyard homes. Um, so with more open space, with less impervious surface, we, we, we've been pushed to the, to the point that we, that we do have houses that are in some instances 10 feet apart, but then your, your fire department has a regulation that, that accommodates that and, and, and obviates their concern. So density is always on the table, but it, this particular um, number of homes Commissioner Gorm was, was picked out um, for a specific reason, and that is the, uh, the homeowners association fees or $300 per month. Um, any number of homes less than this puts it in for, from their experience and from the demographics they've studied uh, a more cost prohibitive set of circumstances. So it's, it's not a figure that was picked out of the thin air is, is done in order to support the project because the HOA is going to be taking care of the 6,200 square foot clubhouse, the, the open space, the streets, the lighting, uh, the walking trails, the various things that are there. Um, it's expensive, but if we spread it out among 100 homes, it can be done. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, I did have one sure. other question for Mr. Sams. Um, we talked about a request from an across-the-street neighbor of the, you call side-by-side, -side, duplex, whatever. Yes, ma'am. In the front there on Wooten Lake, um, moving those units to where... 31, 32, and 33 single family houses are. Yes, ma'am. And kind of doing a swap so that you have the visual of the single family at the front and all the uh, side by sides. Well, if you look together. at the if you look at the um, the architectural renderings, the elevations that you have, you see that the side by side courtyard homes uh, are very analogous to the the single family detached homes in terms of the, the, the way they look. But more importantly, from a marketing perspective, the reason you've got the side by side uh, courtyard homes and the single family detached and the price points going from the, the high twos to the mid and upper fours is to provide the, the variety of, of housing opportunities and styles in this area. 
So I would imagine, and I have, I, I can get Mr. Roll back up here to, to respond more eloquently than I, but I suspect that from a marketing perspective, they would like to have that product uh, visible from Wooten Lake as, as well as the, as the single family detached product. And I know that, that they'll build uh, model homes in each of these to, to start out with to have that positioning. Can it physically be moved to the back where those three lots are? Well, of course it could, but um, I, th I think uh, if the commissioner would allow that, I, I suspect you're going to make this subject to you approving the final site plan as you do in most, most zonings. If that's something that we could look at during plan review and, and continue that, that dialogue as opposed to trying to figure it out from an engineering perspective right now, but I think physically it can probably be done, but do we really want to do it? I don't know. Okay, well, I would like to see I would like to see that done and um, it would come back to me for final approval. Yes, ma'am. But I think, you know, it would fit in more appropriately with the neighboring communities to be single family homes from, from Wooten Lake Road looking at it from the front. And I did have requests from the neighbors across the street that what they'd like to see. Sure. Um, and then also, um, I, in uh, response, I guess, to Commissioner Gorham's question, um, this is RSL, non-supportive RSL only. Yes, ma'am. And um, it is under the five units per acre maximum that we allow for RSL. It's actually 4.7 units per acre. Um, and we do not have the variance now around the perimeter, just the, uh, in the distance between the, the homes. Which is mitigated with the, the parking requirements, yes ma'am. Right. Um, and we do have the, um, the green space intact, which um, to me is important too. Um, the other thing uh, that you <coughs> talked about was um, you added a reversion clause for 24 months, yes, and I'm going to reduce that to 12 months. For what? As a stipulation. And what do they have to do in 12 months? Um, Wait. If a land disturbance permit is not issued within 12 months, it reverts back to the R20 zone. The, the way that it, that it reads is, is if either Wooten Lake does not close on the property or one of its related entities does not close on the property within what we had was 24 months, now 12 months from the issuance of the land disturbance permit, um, or if it's not developed within that period of time, then it reverts back to R20. So we tied into the issuance of the land disturbance permit. Is it, well, the commissioner is asking for 12 months. Is those conditions capable under 12 months? Uh, if, if, it's, if it's tied to the issuance of the land disturbance permit, I'm, we've had it before where, where we've exceeded that and we've come back and the board's understood and we've gotten it extended. So that being the case, then certainly she can make that, that decision for what's best for her district. But I mean, we have done that on one on Roswell Road where we had to come back and get it extended. And, Y'all are accommodating in that respect, so yes. Because the initial deal, the initial developer, the contract didn't go through. And, yes, ma'am. And you had to extend it to the next one. Um, and then on the traffic issue, um, I'd like to point out, I think you mentioned this, but the site distance from this property um, it actually exceeds the 390 feet requirement on both sides. It's 500 plus on, well, may, may I get? 120, I think, on the right. Instead of me or you guessing it, may I bring Mr. Amir up here to answer that? Once again, Abdul Amir with a &R Engineering. With regards to the site distance, uh, looking to the left, from the proposed entrance location, we have approximately 580 feet available site distance. And looking to the right, we have approximately 520 feet. 
for 35 miles an hour uh, speed limit, you need 390 looking each way. So we have what you need for a little more than a 45 miles an hour speed. So even if there is some speeding going on, we have adequate side distance. Okay. And then um, I don't think this was necessarily addressed in your traffic study, but um, and this is normally determined in plan review, but um, I do think a left turn lane is needed there coming from Wade Green to turn into this development because um, we don't want cars to back up, you know, wait, waiting for someone to turn left. And with a 100 unit um, occupancy, I think a left turn lane is needed, but um, that will be determined in plan review. And uh, I, I'm going to defer that to final approval to for the district commissioner. As well in the motion. Okay, I, I just gotta say that if final decision whether or not that turn lane gets in there or not is left to the district commissioner, I have a problem with that stipulation. I believe that the determination whether or not a left turn lane is required should be a DOT um, decision based on the studies they have to do and whether or not it's a compliance and whether or not it's warranted. So um, I just we we got to we got to stick more into letting the staff do the engineering and make the right recommendations as opposed to commissioners overruling or putting their thoughts into it in my opinion so i have a concern with that is that if that's a stipulation well i i can't make any decisions on that until it goes through plan review my, my point is, Commissioner, with all due respect, if you make a stipulation, that final decision as to the, as to the issuance of a, or as to the directive of whether or not a turning lane is required on Wooten Lake is with the district commissioner's office, that will cause concern for my approval of the process. I'm just, let, just advising you that. The, the entire project is of concern to me if if we allow the district commission to make a determination over and above what DOT's recommendation is, if it's in conflict with DOT recommendation. Okay. Well, uh, I'll word it such that it comes back to me once their decision is made. But at least I, I, it comes back to me to know what the well, they, decision is. They should advise you, yes, as to what their decision, the rationale behind it. There's no, I have no concern with that at all, and I, I would encourage that. My concern is with it. If they come back and recommend that it's not required that you, that the district commissioner then turn around and order that to be done regardless of whether it's warranted or not. That's where my concern is. So if, if the motion is such that it, Due diligence is, is at the highest peak with the DOT as to what's warranted there and it's implemented correctly, and that they be you be brought into the discussion and led to understand what it is their recommendation is. I'm I'm fine with that. Okay. Okay. I'll I'll word it, and okay. you object if you have to sure <laughs> i'm sure we'll get um, to the same place the other and that's all i had for thank you for you mr mayor thank you um i guess garvis can you come back up a minute and address the um i'm looking over there <laughs> um besides traffic and you know we've had some we have another property in this immediate area that um, has been continued till February, but on the 10% uh, rental. Yes, ma'am. And uh, I'd also like uh, the county attorney's office and Mr. Peterson to weigh in on my questions on this as well. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that the 10% rental, and it's in your stip letter too, that 
it will not only be um, a stipulation and deed restricted, but also part of the mandatory HOA covenants. It will be in the covenants, conditions, and restrictions, which will be recorded on the Cobb Superior Court deed records and will run with the, with the property as the zoning runs with the property. But it, it's, it's sort of a two-pronged set of circumstances, and I think with the one you're talking about, which I was not cognizant of until we got involved in this in terms of them trying to up their rental uh, percentages, I don't believe that has the dual coverage uh, that this one that we're affording you by virtue of this particular stipulation. No, it doesn't. But I wanted you to explain the difference and how that will apply. Well, I'm, I'm not then, conversant with the, the one that's coming up under other business, so perhaps John uh, or uh, Mr. Atkins. Well, I'm not really concerned about that one. Oh, okay. I want to know how this is going to apply. Well, first of all, it, it's, it was a, it was a supplement, uh, supplemental letter to our stipulation letter that that had that in there that we would agree that no more than 10 percent of any of these units at any one time, and it's, and it's more more or less that's a percentage that we've we've used over the years, would be leased or, or rented out. Um, and then that so that becomes a, it's a stipulation that becomes a condition and a part of the grant of this rezoning binding upon the subject property unless someone comes back and brings it through the zoning process again. That's number one. Number two, we agree that that same provision would be contained in the CCRs, or the covenant conditions and restrictions that are recorded on the deed records and, and the Cobb Superior Court, and they run with the property uh, as well. Uh, enforceable, of course, by you as the, the county, and enforceable, of course, by us, the developer, and or uh, the, as the declarant or the HOA once the developer is completed is turned over to the, the mandatory HOA. Joe, would you like to yeah. address enforcement? We, we prefer that that be a stipulation of zoning. It's fine for it to be in the covenants, but traditionally we have always done it as a stipulation of zoning. Mr. Peterson may need to shake his head right. because he does it on a daily basis. But it's just easier for us. We don't like to get involved in covenants. Right. And that that's, that's why I'm trying to explain for the benefit of the opposition how that is enforced and how that will work from the county perspective. It's, it's easier for us to enforce it if it's just a stipulation of zoning. I don't have a problem if it's the other, but the, our, our really better way to do it is in the zoning stipulations. For us, but got, what Mr. Sams is saying is that he is adding it to the covenants as well. And so it's kind of a dual enforcement, if you will, or safeguard. It protects, the, it protects the HOA, uh, Commissioner Burrell, because they would like to have the, the legal authority to be able to do that. And, and we, as the declarant or as the HOA, can't can enforce the stipulation of zoning unless we come to the code enforcement and, the, and, and get a district commissioner to sponsor that. So it's imperative. With the price points of these homes, uh, it'd be cost prohibitive really for them to become rental product. It'd be hard to believe that that would ultimately happen, but stranger things have. So we want that protection as well. That's the reason it's a, it's a two-edged sword in the way that I've drafted it. Okay. And John, this will be on the deed, so we will be able to enforce that from the zoning stipulation. Well, we don't, we don't enforce covenants or deeds, Commissioner Burrell. The best thing to do if you want to limit rentals is just say maximum 10% rentals for this property, period. And that's it. And that's in the zoning conditions. You know, where we got in trouble with the other one, where it was, it was supposed to be in the covenants. Right. We're not part of that process. Right. But is it okay to keep it dual, to have it enforced by the county and also well, included in the that's covenants? That's what we're talking about. We, we, don't, we do not advise you to try to get the county involved in the enforcement of covenants. That's not something that we have done. It's very difficult for us to do. Okay. So well, maybe we could make there. it two separate conditions. Well, well no, that's, let's, let me just for a minute, okay? What the staff is asking us to do, I believe, is make a stipulation to the effect of the rental cap, which we can then enforce. That's correct. If Mr. Sam's client decides to put covenants in the language in his covenants and all that other stuff he talked about and file it with the state, that is more of an issue related to homeowner to homeowner and, co and homeowner association to homeowner post development that we're not concerned with. That's that's a document that they do for their own benefit. The only document that I hear 
staff recommendation is to act, make sure there's a stipulation to the temp, to the cap rental cap so that we can we can deal with it if it ever comes in front of us. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. If they want to go a step further and do some more stuff that gives their team, their management team or the the residents more legal footing, that's up to them with their yes what they're filing. So we don't have to stipulate to that as long as we have a stipulation to the cap. Exactly. In our in our zoning. No. But we do have a mandatory HOA as part of we the. We stipulate to that, yes. Yes. But what conditions that mandatory HOA imposes on themselves is their doing as, a, as, a, as they follow state law and all, everything associated with it. That's correct. Okay. So do we need to revise the stipulation that addresses the dual components? It, it would be my preference that you do that, yes. Okay. And I believe that was an addendum, correct? It was a supplemental letter, yes, ma'am. Dated. <laughs> Let's see. December 1st. Yes, December 1st. Yes, ma'am. Number 18. Yes, ma'am. Basically, 18 can be modified to say the applicant agrees that at any time in the future there should be no more than 10% of the homes which may be rental lease, period. And the balance of that is up to the homeowners group. Okay. And the HOA mandatory stipulation is a separate point as well, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's already in there. The That's in the November 13th letter got it okay we number clear six. That? so yes, that stays in okay um i'd also like to uh include for the record dave braden's comments revised stormwater management com comments dated december 12th and ask him to come up and address those briefly. I know you were up here explaining the process, but we need some assurance here on the stormwater management runoff. And does the clerk need this? You have one. The only revision, revision to my previous comments were uh, the additional comments number six regarding uh, there is a portion of the site that discharges toward Wooten Lake Road, um, and it's kind of a weird situation because the road's super elevated there as it comes around the curve, and then it drops off the right of way, kind of into into a, a hole. And depending on how they grade that entrance, some of the site may may be directed toward the right of way. There, and my comment is just that any runoff that is directed to the right of way be tied directly to the existing pipe that's at that that i guess you call it the southwest corner uh, that's in the right of way so that's really the only change from my previous comments mm -hmm. and all that will be determined in plan review right when they when they design their infrastructure okay but the pipe is already the pipe is already there in the right of way so they can tie it they can tie the, the uh, if they wind up having to put a pond in that in that front corner, they can tie it directly to that that existing pipe. Okay. Um, and also, that's all I have okay. for you. Um, the landscape plan is that in the record? Do you have a date on that, John? That that was submitted. It the landscape plan. The landscape plan was submitted contemporaneously with the revised site plan that did away with the variance request on the perimeter buffer issue. I believe it's in <clears throat> letter dated December 9, but I'll verify that for you, Commissioner. Okay. Well, it has 12 8 
Right, yes, ma'am, it's a December 9 letter, the landscape plan, which you may not have in front of you, but it's... Okay. December 9th letter. Okay. Do you want to go over that while you're up there? Sure, I'll be, I'll be happy to. Uh, in most instances, the 20-foot the perimeter buffer around RSLs uh, is, 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 is typically not defined uh, in terms of the, the type of genus and species and the type of vegetation that goes in there. But, but what we have done on, on December the 9th is uh, we, we've submitted this landscape buffer that will actually describe the, the various kinds of names that are in there. Uh, first, we'll have uh, the, the different kinds of uh, foliage and white flowers in the in the spring uh, with with fruit component that'll uh, add uh, attract birds and fast growing. Then we'll have cryptomeria. Uh, it's got a Latin name here that I won't even begin to try to uh, to pronounce, but obviously that's that's evergreen uh, year round. And then you have the the juniper trees as well, uh, juniper blue points, or what they call. The advantages of this is that they're fast growing and, and also planted six feet apart with the cryptomerias planted eight feet on center for a dense screen. These gives you the sec or this gives you rather the, the typical elevation or section in the 20 foot landscape strip. So you've got <clears throat> the high evergreen vegetation and then you've got the, the low lying uh, understory uh, along the, the property line or within the landscape buffer as you, as you see here with different types of of holly bushes and uh, and the like, and, and again, all, all this would be submitted <coughs> to the um, to the arborster and the uh, plan review process. But we wanted to give the the residents an idea just what would be in there, even though typically that's not not done until plan review because they asked for it. Right. Okay. Okay, are there any other questions yeah, we're on good. the board? We're good. Um, just a suggestion that when you're discussing with the applicant some of the stuff you talked about in the very beginning of your comments, um, <clears throat> I know there's an attempt to have like five different varieties of housing, and I think one, one way you might be able to address some of Commissioner Gorham's concerns, and I, and I don't know which ones are which, Garvis, on the um, site plan, but the, um, I guess it's lots, 56, whatever whatever type of style that is um, on the site plan behind you. You know, bringing Commissioner on the site plan back up, the, the different. Right, whatever whatever the group is that starts with 56, um, I, I don't know if it's possible when you're looking at addressing some of um, Commissioner Burrell's comments about whether it can swap that type of home with the the ones across the back or the north part of the property I think Commissioner she was talking about taking these and swapping them putting in these in this area and, and vice versa I believe that's what okay well thinking. just a, a suggestion while you're looking at making some modifications is the possibility of swapping whatever style that is with the ones that are on the north because there's like 19 units of the bigger style and like 24 units across the top I don't, and I don't know if it's possible to swap them because that would address some of Commissioner Gorham's comments about possibly reducing the number of units that um, go up against the existing homes to the north. We we had to when we um, when we reconfigured the landscape uh, strip, we had to, to relocate some of the the product because it was rear loaded, and so we made some adjustments. So. And I guess that's the reason we always have a stipulation where where the, the site plan. Can have minor modifications if they don't do certain things that would be in violation of the ordinance or require a variance just to give you the latitude during plan review to move things around. I suspect you're going to see a lot of movement of a lot of products simply because of that issue, and, and it's very possible they they could lose some units because of floodplain and some other other issues, Mr. Ott. But we'll we'll look at that. Yeah, they may lose some anyway in plan review. Thank okay. you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Burrell. Okay. I think I'm ready to make a motion.
Okay, I would like to make a motion to approve Z88 um, to the RSL zoning category, non-supportive only, RSL. Um, with letters, stipulation letters, dated November 13th for Mr. Sams, December 1st, December 9th, including the landscape plan and revised site plan. Um, also to include the December 12th revised stormwater management comments from Mr. Braden. Um, site plan specific with the district commissioner having final approval. Um, also, the architectural style and drawings be approved by the district commissioner. Um, reversion clause of no land disturbance permit within 12 months or the property reverts back to R20 original zoning. And the uh, DOT's final determination of decel lane and left turn lane be reviewed and um, approved by the district commissioner. Um, all fire comments, stormwater management, planning commission and staff comments not otherwise in conflict and um, maximum of 100 units per acre, um, sorry, maximum of 100 units on the non-supportive RSL. I forgot to include that. And then the um, maximum of 10% rental um, on number 18, Stip letter dated November 13th, I believe. First, December 1st. December 1st, sorry. Um, number 18 will read, the applicant agrees that at any time in the future thou sh there shall be no more than 10% of the homes which may be rented slash leased, period. And then all other stipulations remain. Okay, my only request is that the review of the DOT for the turn lane of Wooten Road not be subject to your approval. Well, how about review and notification to the district commission? That'd be, I, that, that'd be fine. And I'll second the motion. Any other comments or questions? Uh, yes. The, re the reason for doing that is if, if it's not warranted, then, and I concur with that, that gives me the opportunity to state that it wasn't warranted and Correct. We no, can't, why we can't do it. I'm with you. I'm with you 100%. I'm with you 100%. So we have a motion and a second. Any other comments? Call the question. Motion carries 3-1 with Commissioner Gore in opposition. Yes, we can, very much so. We're going to take a five-minute break. Thank you.
Back to the Board of Commissioners zoning hearing for December 16th, 2014, 2014. This is Commissioner Gorham's last zoning hearing. If I recall, we stopped at Z88 and we're now at Z91. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Rezoning case Z91, Tanglewood Development Incorporated. Request rezoning from R20 LSC to R15 for the purpose of a single family residential subdivision in land lots 48 and 49 of the 16th district. The property is located on the northeast side of Jamerson Road, northeast of Hawk Trail. The applicant's representative is present. Earlier, there were six people here in opposition. All those wishing to address the board, please come forward to be sworn in. Mr. Moore. Thank you and good morning. Uh, Kevin Moore here on behalf of the applicant and owner Tanglewood Development on this application for rezoning. Uh, the property is 12 and a half acres located on the north side of Jamerson Road. Uh, the property currently is zoned R20 OSC. Uh, the request is to rezone the property to R15 and I want to show you on the site plan really what that means. Um, in terms of, of this particular application. And once he pulls that up, great. And then talk about uh, some of the history of this particular piece of property and its zoning as well as the surrounding zonings. Uh, but first, just to explain what we're doing, uh, this is the 12 and a half acre track, uh, Jamerson Road. Uh, this track was zoned R20 OSC in 2000. Uh, it was brought in uh, as a proposal uh, to rezone the property from R30 to R15. At that time, the Board of Commissioners uh, made a decision and deleted it to R20 OSC. And what they did at that time, and what the Board did at that time, was rezone this <coughs> tract R20 OSC and said that uh, uh, three lots had to be open space. Uh, it was proposed in 2000 for a 23 lot R20 subdivision. Um, the uh, Board of Commissioners voted and said uh, R20 OSC instead of R15 and pulled three <coughs> lots and said those have to be open space uh, and rezone that in 2000. Uh, this proposal uh, is to rezone it from R20 OSC to R15 uh, so that uh, two of the three lots that had been lost in 2000 uh, can be uh, put back into this development so um, that it would be a true R15 uh, development and subdivision instead of an R20 OSC that doesn't meet R20 OSC um, uh, requirements uh, or ordinances, uh, but instead have it as a standard R15 subdivision. And I want to go through, uh, typically you don't see these come back in this type of fashion, but uh, uh, since 2000, uh, the reason why this has come forward uh, is because of zoning actions and developments that have occurred. Uh, adjacent to, across the street from, and in the Jam and on Jamerson Road, uh, that uh, result in a situation where this property, uh, from a, from the owner and developer standpoint, is being singled out, um, not not being treated as if the other properties have been treated along this corridor. I'm going to turn now to some sheets that uh, go through that for you. Uh, the first. Uh, exhibit that I'd like to show you uh, is what you find in your zoning analysis book. Uh, it's more of a close-in look at the property uh, and the surrounding zonings, and you're used to seeing this each and every month uh, for your zoning um, applications. Again, you see uh, in the hatched area is the property zoned R20 OSC and Jamerson Road. And what you see is the properties surrounded on this, this northern side all the way to Jamerson Road by R15. And then you'll notice there's an R30 adjacent to it uh, going south on Jamerson Road, and then another R15 here, which you'll see across the street. Uh, and I want to point these out uh, in particular. You'll see this is an R20, very small R20 subdivision here. You'll see two R30 homes here, 
and you see it R15 here uh, that's located directly across Jamerson Road. And that's within the tight uh, landlot of, uh, that this property finds itself at, per your zoning map. And now I'm going to kind of go to a wider view of, of Jamerson Road. <coughs> as he focuses in, and this is the aerial um, the zoning map. And again, what you'll see is this is the R20 OSC that's the subject property, the 12 and a half acres. And then what you find is you'll see the, the amount of R15 uh, that is located on Jamerson Road, both on the northern side of Jamerson Road and the southern side of Jamerson Road. You see all of this R15 through here, all of this R15, both on the south side here and the north side here. Also coming down uh, Jamerson Road, as it turns to Wigley Road, you'll see again R15 located on the northern side of Jamerson uh, and continued R15 going uh, down Jamerson Road as well. And you have R20s and, R th and the, the one section of R30 here, but what you see is that R30 is really uh, the spot zoning as it's related to uh, the zonings along Jamerson Road now. Um, the predominant category is R15 with a little bit of R20, and you'll see that R20 right here, but we're going to talk about that in a second as well, and just moving forward. The first thing I want to point out uh, is, and this is the minutes from, and you'll see that the date, May 15, 2001, uh, not even quite a year after the subject property was zoned R20 OSC. The Board of Commissioners in 2001 took action. You see it was on the consent agenda, uh, Z38 of 2001. And what you'll see is it's listed as property located on, uh, on Jamerson Road, rezoned from R30 to R15, approved uh, as part of the consent agenda. That's directly across the street from this property, uh, directly across the street on Jamerson Road that was rezoned R30 to R15. What you'll note as part of this, there's no provision for um, uh, arbitrary designation of open space. There's no provision for a loss of lots. There's no provision for some sort of arbitrary designation of OSC. Rather, it's zoned R15. And you'll also note that one of the owners of this property that was zoned to R15 directly across the street from this property uh, is Mr. Charles Kaniski. Now, I like Mr. Kaniski. Uh, I've had several conversations with him. He lives adjacent to the subject property, and he'll probably speak in opposition to this application. He lives in the R30 track that's adjacent to this track. But what he was a part of and zoned, uh, signed the zoning application, and ultimately, a couple of months later, sold the property to the developer and benefited from a zoning from R30 to R15 directly across the street from this property. Uh, I certainly don't want to... Um, condemn the man or criticize him from benefiting from a rezoning. That's what this process is about. But yet he stands, will stand here in opposition today to the very rezoning request that he benefited from in 2001. Uh, the next uh, zoning minutes are from 2006. In 2006, uh, which is Z76, uh, is a rezoning application. And you'll see that the application was from R30 to R15. And you'll see that in this uh, application that was on Jamerson Road, the board deleted that to R20. And if you remember, and approved an R20 rezoning on Jamerson Road. And if you remember, I showed you that R20 piece that was um, directly across the street from this property. And if you'll go back to that first map, if you can help me here. And that R20 that I showed you from 2006 is this R20 right here. You can keep it right there if you want. Is this R20 directly across the street? Now, that was deleted to R20. However, um, that was for purposes of placing it on the map only. This R20, all of the lots are a minimum of 15,000 square feet. Uh, it is not an R20 subdivision in terms of minimum 20,000 square foot lots. It does not have an arbitrary designation of open space. It does not have an arbitrary loss of lots. It was deleted R20, but all those lots are minimum 15,000 square feet. Which, um, again, uh, goes to show that what happened since 2000, it's not about necessarily what occurred in 2000, even though this owner at that time didn't agree to the deletion to R20 OSC and the loss of lots and designation of open space. But had that, been, had that type of decision making continued over the next decade, or at least over the next six years, um, 
perhaps things would be differently. But instead what occurred is that subsequent to that decision, uh, uh, Cobb County rezoned property directly across the street to R15, directly across the street to R20, which is really R15 because those lots are minimum 15,000 square foot lots without designating pieces of it as open space or without designating loss of lots for those applications. Uh, and those were subsequent to it. And I think now this application finds itself in a position and the owner finds itself in a position of, well, you know, why, why was this property the only one singled out in that manner? Uh, as a result, the R15 designation uh, that is being proposed here today is appropriate, it's justifiable. It would be an R15 with all minimum 15,000 square foot lots located adjacent to R15, which is the predominant category on Jamerson Road. Uh, in 2000, this application, three lots were deleted from the application. He, uh, this applicant is only asking for restoration of two lots uh, as part of that. Uh, and with that, we believe the application is justified uh, and would respectfully request your uh, vote for approval today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Opposition, please. I am the notorious Charles Kaninsky. I live at 2681 Jamerson Road, um, uh, directly adjacent to that property. And I can answer uh, Mr. Moore's question about why was his property singled out. But first I feel I need to defend my reputation. Um, years ago, four acres across the street from my property came up for sale. And a developer was sniffing around wanting to buy it and turn it into a subdivision. I didn't want to be looking at the backside of a subdivision, so my neighbor and I bought the property. We were inundated with requests to sell it to developers, and we resisted. Uh, eventually, one developer came up with a novel idea, and that was he bought the four acres behind our four acres, and he just wanted a strip off of the back of mine to make his subdivision, and I wouldn't see it. So I said, yes, I would agree to selling a strip off of the back of my subdivision, which is how my name got attached to somebody else's subdivision that I had nothing to do with. I didn't apply for an R15, and I guess that's the way things are done. So anyway, um, I don't think I'm the bad guy that I may be made out to be. The R20 across the street that isn't really an R20 was because the neighbors got together and fought the rezoning effort from an R15 to an R20, and they, it was an R30 originally. So as a compromise, um, the zoning board said, well, we'll make it an R20, and it is only a name only, but it, it's an R20. Uh, Mr. Pearson is not being discriminated against. I don't think he's being treated unfairly. And it doesn't matter what is around him, one piece of property as an R15 doesn't mean everything for miles around can be rezoned R15. Let me get to the heart of the, meat, of the matter right now, and that is this piece of property is unique in that it, it is sitting in a V and all the water that comes down used to drain into a dry stream bed which carried it down to uh, Jamerson Road and eventually to the Etowah River. And Mr. Pearson's originally planned to put those three lots in where the dry stream bed was. We had an uh, environmental um, survey done, and it said that because of the slopes, which in some cases were 35%, um, and the fact that the composition of the dirt was chert, which is a very dusty um, sort of dirt that, that can blow away and is really hard to keep in place, and the fact that there are so many water problems that it was a totally unsuitable site for his original plan. I think the board at the time in their original wisdom, Sam Olins being the uh, commissioner, um, saw an opportunity here for a win-win situation and that was by calling it an R20 OSC, he preserved some green space which we definitely needed. It was environmentally and ecologically uh, sound and it helped preserve wildlife and it solved the water problem. Because right now, and I have pictures, here's, here's a picture. Uh, this shows the lay of the land as it comes down in the bottom of the gully that, that is a dry stream bed. 
Um, this runs through those two lots. Eventually, uh, it dumps into Mr. Pearson's uh, uh, detention pond, which originally was lot number 23. So he would have liked to have built on lot 23, but that happens to be in the detention pond. Um, so if we can show the next one with some of the pictures of the rain. Um, keep going. There we go. Now this is the dry stream bed after a rainstorm. You can see the, the water coming down there. It definitely meets the state definition of what is a stream. And the stream is a, is a, is a, a, a bed that carries water during and up to three days after, I think, a rainstorm. This qualifies under state guidelines as a stream. And there is a, a law that says you can't build within 25 feet of a stream bed. Somehow or other, um, that, that doesn't get addressed here. But uh, there's a significant amount of water. And because of the slope of the land, if Mr. Pearson is able to fill in this whole lower level um, and put a house there, well, the, the water is not going to stop. The water is going to keep coming across my property and go into that stream bed. And if the stream bed isn't there, it's going to go into the houses. The same problem that Mr. Christopher is having on the other side of Pearson's property over there in Falcon Crest. Um, I think there's an ecologically sound reason why Mr. Olins uh, offered that compromise to Mr. Pearson. This is 14 years ago. We're still waiting for a resolution of this property. And Mr. Pearson agreed to accept these two lots and this, this detention and green space area as part of the resolution of this zoning request he made back in 2000. Um, I don't know why he keeps coming back to asking for these two lots back. In the previous planning commission hearing, Mr. Moore said those two lots are very valuable. And I understand they're worth money to Mr. Pearson, but they're also valuable from an environmental and ecological and, and a wildlife um, standpoint. I urge you, please, to, rec to uh, uh, respect the uh, staff comments and the planning department's uh, comments about uh, deny recommending denial. We would like to see this resolved and, and, and go on to let him build those 20 houses and let us get our lives back together and let's get the uh, uh, green space and the trees and everything else back to where it needs to be. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Just for the record, are there any other speakers in opposition? The public hearing is closed. Commissioner Burrow. Um, <clears throat> I'd, I'd like to point out um, in the staff comments that this is um, in a low density residential area. The um, adjoining properties Are I just had it R30 on the well, excuse me, R15 on the north, R30 on the south, R30 on the east, and on the west is R15 and R30. The um, property across the street that Mr. Moore referenced. Uh, that is R15 is a much differ different topography than the um, property in question and there have been issues with um, drainage on that property and um, I, I can't support removing open space especially at, at this location um, so with that I would like make a motion to deny Z91. You second that? Okay. There's a motion, there's a second to deny. Is there any other comments? Call the question. Motion carries 4-0. Thank you. <coughs> that takes us to LUP 38. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. LUP 38, St. Benedict's Episcopal Church. Of course, they land use permit from the, <coughs> from the farmer's market. And land lots 694 and 695 of the 17th district. 
The property is located on the east side of Cooper Lake Road, the west side of Atlanta Road, uh, north of Cumberland Parkway. The applicant is present. Is there anyone here opposed to LDP 38? Let the record show there's one person opposed. All those wishing to address the board, please come forward to be sworn in. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Brian Sullivan, rector of St. Benedict's Episcopal Church. Uh, we are uh, standing before you today to um, have our farmer's market uh, approved according to the new um, ordinance that you all passed in August, um, ordinance number 134-36. Uh, according to the stipulation letter that uh, we sent before the planning hearing and the subsequent stipulation letter that we sent before this hearing, uh, I'll just summarize what it says. We're going to use the farmer's market to make homemade products and baked items. It'll be seasonal. There'll be uh, no more than 27 vendors. There'll be no food trucks on this site. The farmer's market will run from 4.30 to 8 p.m. between April and late November. The tents will be set up after our carpool activities end, which will be approximately uh, 4 o'clock or after 3.45. All trash will be removed. Uh, the vendors will use pop-up style tents. All the vendors will comply with uh, permits and license licensing. We have a market manager who is going to uh, make sure that those licenses are valid. We'll provide signage uh, both for the event and for entrance and exit, parking, start and end times, etc. There'll be a list of approved goods uh, per the new county code. We will not use any loudspeakers, bells, or amplified noise making. Uh, no rides, video games, arcade, mechanical games, or mechanical rides. No sale of firearms, ammunition, weapons will be sold. We will offer uh, blood drives and bounce houses. And uh, according to the second stipulation letter that we sent, uh, there will be um, limited to three blood drives and two bouncy houses. Uh, the area shown on the map in red is where the blood drives and bouncy houses will be located uh, to the top left corner of the lot. Currently there are uh, tents shown there. We have had an average of about 15 to 17 vendors and rarely use that space. Uh, if we are successful enough to have 27 total vendors, uh, we will not have a blood drive or a bouncy house uh, in that location. And then finally, uh, all of this, of course, is um, according to district commissioner's approval uh, in compliance with the county code. And just to make it very clear, we will be um, limited to the county code number 134-36. At uh, this time, I'd like to uh, invite our Deacon Leslie Ann Drake to come forward. Um, she is uh, the executive director of our mission that um, gets the proceeds from this. And just to let you know why we are doing this uh, and why we uh, enjoy the farmer's market. Leslie. Morning, Commissioners. I'm Leslie Andrake. I'm the Deacon at St. Benedict's, and I run a ministry called Path to Shine, which is about helping underserved children by after-school mentoring and tutoring. There are 16 million children living in poverty in this country, and we're trying to help a few of them. We have two programs running here in Cobb County, and the proceeds, as Father Brian said, from the farmer's market, the vendor fees, not the profits that the vendors make, but their fees that they pay, um, a large portion of those go to support Path to Shine. It's the equivalent of about 10% of our budget. We've been running the farmer's market now for five years. Um, the market manager and I got involved two years ago, so this next year would be our third year of running it. Um, we certainly learned a lot in the process, but I'd like to assure everyone that we are very cognizant and very aware of the children on property and considering that this benefits children, we have no, 
we, we're not trying to harm children. We're trying to keep them safe on everything that we do. So I know there are concerns that have been raised about this, and that's why we're very careful about the parking, about the times that set up, about the way it's cleared up, and um, security into the building is also monitored. Thank you. Thank you. Opposition, please. Merry Christmas. I'm Mary Rose Barnes, Oakdale Community Association. Uh, this application is the first for farmers markets since the um, implementation impl impl since the farmers market uh, code became uh, came approved in, in August. Uh, therefore, OCA board believes that extra care should be taken to ensure that the tenants of the code are upheld. And we do have to maintain, as we always have that we realize that the O&I code does not allow any outside sales. So in any event, this, if this is approved, will be in violation of the code. The applica application, applicant has applied for uses that do not fall into the category of displayed inventory of products, food products. Uh, how Mr. Uh, Reverend Sullivan said that they did not, uh, they were talking about only having homemade goods. However, he submitted an application that requested the sale of jewelry, books, soaps, and sh shopping bags, and additionally health services. None of these have fallen into the category. It is not, I'm not sure what he was referring to. Uh, he could have put those under, under, um, under uh, homemade goods. He has um, sometimes we don't understand exactly what he's saying. In addition, if fresh meats are to be allowed, they should be clearly stated that all meats be refrigerated on site. Otherwise, there is a strong possibility of contamination or spoilage. We are forced to accept the county's position that mechanized bounce houses are not mechanized uh, rides because the state does not describe them as such. However, we do not accept the church's presumption that they are safe. In the past year, there were national news reports of at least two incidents of these devices flying into the air as high as 300 feet. I do not want to think of a bouncy house 300 feet over Atlanta Road at rush hour. With children trapped inside, several children were injured. Both CNN and ABC have aired reports on the dangers of bounce houses with injuries resulting from collisions with other children, falls, collapse, the devices, and onto the children, and loosening of the supports. I have, some, I have some supplied the information to the clerk. In 2010 alone, 31 children a day were treated in emergency rooms due to injuries from bounce houses. One child every 45 minutes. These are emergency visits, emergency room visits, not just a mother, a mother taking care of a child has been hurt. Dr. Gary Smith of a nationwide children's hospital stated that these, if these numbers were statistics for infectious diseases, these injuries would be considered a public health emergency. Since the state does not define bounce houses as mechanizes, mechanized, there are no state requirements for maintenance, manufacture, operation, safety procedures, installation, tie-down requirements, weather condition rules, number of, number of children using it at one time, licensing of operators, or liability insurance required. Neither are there any federal, state, or county standards for it, nor any other industry standards. The church has not stated whether or not it carries li specific liability insurance for these bounce houses, or even if it has notified their insurance carrier of these attractive nuisances. The church has not stated whether the operator would be licensed, or even if the hander would be a professional operator. St. Benedict's has, has, has access to the same information, but chose to forgo implementation of it to the detriment of common sense safety standards. Please eliminate bounce houses, bounce houses or any related carnival apparat apparatuses from consider consideration of this learning application. The farmer's market is also applying to utilize a blood bank, which offers nothing for sale and there clearly violates the code. Aside from code issues, the imposition of a truck the size of a Greyhound bus represents a severe pedestrian traffic hazard, especially for the small tract. We would request that you follow PC's requirements 
recommendation rather to prohibit the church from using the nearby campus for parking. There is no light, stop sign, or even a crosswalk on Cooper Lake Road. The applicant failed to include this recommendation in his December stipulation letter. In addition, we request that no modi modifications by the district commissioner conflict with the code or the zoning stipulations. This past year, the church continued in its history of code violations with signs in the right of way and not requiring the mandated business licenses for their vendors. It is to be hoped that the church will be more considerate of county rules and regulations in the coming year. And we thank you. And Mer again, Merry Christmas. Thank you, ma'am. Any other speakers? Seeing hearing on the public hearing, uh, the public hearing is closed. Commissioner Ott, would you lead our conversation? Thank you, please? Mr. Chairman. Um, as Reverend Sullivan said, this uh, farmer's market has been in front of the board numerous times, uh, basically for the last four years, in various shapes and forms, um, because prior to this August, there was not a um, separate code dealing with farmer's markets, but there is now, and so that's why it says a land use permit. Um, I just have a, a couple of questions, John. Um, the Ms. Barnes had the question about the meats. Is that not required by the health department that it be refrigerated if you have a sale of meats? Oh, that's correct. Okay, so if they did have meats, they would have to meet that requirement anyway. Oh, that's correct. Okay. Um, all right. Um, if there are not any other questions or comments, I'm going to make a motion. Go forward, please. All right. I make a motion to approve LUP 38 um, subject to all the uh, Planning Commission comments and recommendations and just kind of review these. Um, site plan reviewed by the Zoning Division on October 30th, 2014. Um, the letter of agreeable uh, conditions from Rever Reverend Brian Sullivan dated November 24th, 2014 with the following changes to that um, on item number 11, add to the end, which will be appropriately located as indicated on in the site map. Number 13, add to the end, parking for the farmer's market will not be allowed to the school parking lot, which is located on the opposite side of Cooper Lake Road. Item number 14 is included in the other letter I'm gonna reference. Um, and then applicant to meet code requirements for the farmer's market uh, found in section 134-36. Exhibit A received by the zoning division dated October 30th, 2014. Exhibit B received by the zoning division October 30th, 2014. Um, in addition, um, the letter of agreeable conditions from Reverend Sullivan dated December 9th, 2014. Um, all uh, DOT comments and recommendations, all other staff comments and recommendations, um, all other stipulations and conditions to remain in effect, not otherwise in conflict. And what I'd like to do, um, since there's numerous letters as um, the commissioners know in your books with various different um, stipulations and conditions. So what I'd like to do is add a separate stipulation that prior to the opening of the farmer's market that the applicant will submit a new letter to the zoning division manager that compiles all of the existing stipulations on the church, the school, and the farmer's market, breaking them down in those three categories so that we have a single letter that lists all the stipulations and conditions so that it's easy for everyone to find. Um, that letter to be approved by the zoning division manager and then um, approved by the district commissioner. And then that'll become kind of the controlling document because everything, we're not adding stipulations. We're just putting them in one place um, unless Joe tells me I need to bring it back as another business. And this approval would be for 12 months since this is the first um, farmers market under the new code what I'd like to do is do it for 12 months just in case there's issues that come up so um, Joe do I need to bring that letter back to the board as another business item or since it's just bringing all the things together in one place if, if, if all you're doing is just using that essentially as to make it an easier enforcement tool for staff it does not need to come right back. and that's that's really what I'm trying to do is I would just like um, Reverend Sullivan to take because we have stipulations and conditions on the church we have stipulations and conditions on the school and then we have stipulations and conditions on farmers market I would just like them all in one place as long as you don't change anything right okay uh, Commissioner uh, uh, the school meaning both the middle school site and the current site that we yes okay right so there may be four sets okay to that to that end um, 
that was one of the clarifications I want to make. Is it possible when we create this document, John, though I know it's possible, would we also please consider a footnote under each stipulation as to what where it going, came from? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because ultimately, if you get into an enforcement situation, we would have to rely on what was Correct. passed so, through you. This is just really more to help right. everybody know. This is just right. kind of like when, because when you go through all the stuff in our book, yeah. it's. No, I'm with you. I understand. I'm right. This, and your recap, if it could point to when when that stipulation was agreed to, so that we, since we're doing the research, we can. Okay. Have and it all and Reverend way. Sullivan <laughs> said he understands what we're requesting. So. Sure. Um, and like I said, this is for 12 months. Mainly just because this is um, the first time out of the shoot with a farmer's market. So that'll be my motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any other comments? Call the question. The motion carries 4 0. So that takes us to our next first only held case, Z48. Rezone case Z48, David Pearson Communities Incorporated. Of course, rezoning from LRO to FST for the purpose of detached single family townhouses. In land lots 629 and 630 of the 16th district. The property is located on the south side of First Drive, east of Sandy Plains Road. The applicant's representative is present. Is there anyone here opposed to rezoning case Z48? Let the record show there's no one opposed. Mr. Moore. Thank you. And again, Kevin Moore here on behalf of the applicant and owner um, in this application for rezoning. And uh, this was held in November uh, for us to continue uh, to work with the Arbor Oaks Homeowners Association. Uh, really, the, the proposed project um, uh, for uh, 11 homes on this property that is zoned LRO in this location uh, has never really been an issue. Uh, what was uh, had really zeroed in on, on the issue was how to um, provide for effective management of stormwater, uh, how to minimize impact to the Arbor Oaks Homeowner Association, but more importantly, the Har Arbor Oaks uh, residents themselves. Uh, that's if you'll see, you can keep the map up that's now on your screens. Our property is right down there in the middle, the LRO tract, and then to the right. Uh, or to the east of that tract is you'll see the SC for suburban condominium, um, which was uh, that's Arbor Oaks. And so what uh, what we did is and had been doing over this period of time, and I just want to update you with that is uh, had our engineers continue to meet, continue to work, met with Arbor Oaks, uh, have had a lot of discussions with them, and they've all been good, good conversations and good discussions. Continue to. Uh, bother uh, Dave Braden at Stormwater uh, with uh, with ideas, and what we were finally able to do, I think, is is and I know is is to reach a resolution that really is a win win for all the parties involved, and especially for Arbor Oaks and for this project. Um, it's representative. There was a stipulation letter dated December tenth, um, which provides for these uh, stip for the stipulations that we had agreed upon all but the drainage plan. Uh, now the new drainage plan has been included within uh, that stipulation letter. And let me show you what that is and then I can conclude. Thanks. Uh, this is the drainage uh, plan that is shown as part of uh, the stipulation letter. Uh, here is First Drive and you'll see Arbor Oaks, the suburban condominium development here in the subject property here. Uh, if you recall, um, Arbor Oaks has um, Currently, this pipe uh, that's part of their development is a pipe that runs along the rear to their detention pond. Um, they receive water from uh, the office property that's located here that comes around our property and into this area. Uh, they receive water from First Drive that comes down the street and then starts to go through this property and go into this area as well. Um, if you recall before, we were working on a drainage solution that would combine, pick this water up, uh, work on some of the inadequacies in their drainage system and put a new pipe across uh, the rear of Arbor Oaks. Uh, what we were ultimately able to do is say, 
let's not do that. And uh, uh, to the credit of the engineers and uh, the developer, um, we're able to provide for underground detention, uh, and then to if you'll follow the you can follow the red line, and that is to then carry that pipe uh, out to first drive and down the right of way to its ultimate release point and discharge point, which is the common discharge point for uh, both uh, both sides of the street uh, down in this location. That's been reviewed by Dave Braden. That's where the water is going, um, and that allows for appropriate detention and then pipe in the discharge, which is where all of this is going anyway. And it avoids having to disrupt uh, the residents of Arbor Oaks and disrupt their rear um, yard areas along here. It avoids that disruption, avoids disruption to uh, those that may live to the rear on Moselle Drive. Uh, and it also, the water that currently um, would uh, drain from this uh, from this property and drains to Arbor Oaks, now gets picked up and gets taken off of that dra drainage system in Arbor Oaks. In addition, water coming down First Drive is caught in our uh, curbing and placed in our detention facility and again, pipe. So what you're doing is reducing, and you don't see that very often, but we're actually reducing the volume of water coming onto Arbor Oaks, which is significant in and of itself, but will help them uh, but more importantly, able to do that and not have to disrupt um, their rear yards. And they're here today, and you can see that this time they did not stand up in opposition, and I think that's uh, a real testament to Cobb County Stormwater Management, a real testament to centerline surveying and engineering, a real testament to uh, this um, uh, developer, and a real testament to the, to the people of Arbor Oaks who stuck with this, and we all worked together to get to this place. Uh, that's the update we've, like I said, that's now included in the stipulation letter dated December 10th so that that is the drainage plant. Uh, obviously it will be subject to final engineering and approval and any specific adjustments from uh, Cobb County Stormwater Division during plan review, but the path now for drainage has been established. Uh, in addition, there's a letter dated December 12th that's just a one paragraph supplement once we uh, uh, received an additional comment last Thursday from Arbor Oaks who wanted to make sure that as it related to a landscape buffer uh, that they're provided input during plan review as to that buffer and certainly with the cooperation and consideration we've had all along we wanted to afford them that opportunity and so uh, the December 12th letter is just a supplement just simply allows for that input and opportunity for Arbor Oaks to continue as it relates to that buffer. Uh, and lastly, one other change that they pointed out for me, Exhibit B to the uh, December 10th letter contains um, pictures of, of various homes and, uh, for the product. Um, and we had uh, inadvertently, or I had inadvertently placed pictures in there that don't belong. Uh, they pointed that out to me, thankfully. Uh, and so what I've asked, I've, I've got the correct set uh, that's already marked as Exhibit B. Um, that needs to be substituted for the Exhibit B that was in our letter because uh, it had uh, some uh, inadvertently placed pictures that don't belong as far as the product. So if I could do that and um, so that if there's any motion for approval, it would need to include the Exhibit B photographs of, of home product that I have just submitted to the clerk as opposed to that what's contained in the December 10th letter. Um, that's part of our agreement with Arbor Oaks, and we're happy to have done that and glad they caught it, quite frankly. Um, with that, <coughs> we'd ask that this uh, application for rezoning be respectfully approved. Uh, it is as fully contained in this letter of December 10th and letter of December 12th. Uh, contains all of the conditions and stipulations that have been worked out, uh, and I think to the credit of the developer and to Arbor Oaks and to the engineer in the county, uh, a surreal win situation that has occurred here. Uh, in this area. So uh, with that, I'm here to answer any questions. Mr. Doug Pat Patton with Centerline Survey and Engineering is also here to answer any questions of a technical nature that I might not be able to. Thank you. Thank you. Just for the record, there's no opposition, correct? Thank you. Commissioner Burrell. Thank you. Well, Kevin, we've come a long way <laughs> from Z48. Um, this was actually continued twice by this board. Um, but I do want to commend you, Mr. Patton, of course, 
he's really the one who did all this work. Um, <laughs> and of course, the neighbors and our staff, Mr. Braden and and staff that we've we've met many times with the uh, Arbor Oaks surrounding neighbors and um, and also with uh, I'd like to thank Chad Apple who represented them on the engineering side for the stormwater uh, management piece. Um, but I think this shows that you know if we work together and hold things till we get it right then it's a win-win for everybody so um, and and I do appreciate you too adding the additional steps that that you did today based on comments from Arbor Oaks now that we have the stormwater resolved so um, I'm ready to make a motion unless anybody has any questions um, I'd like to make a motion to approve Z48, deleting from LRO to RA6. Correct. Um, subject to stipulation letters dated December 10th with the revised drawings of our pictures um, in Exhibit E being replaced today. And um, the amended letter dated December 12th. Um, which shows the new uh, site plan for the drainage. And um, this will be site plan specific and um, with final approval by the district commissioner and all other staff comments planning commission recommendations not otherwise in conflict there's a motion and a second any comments on the board just make um i just want to thank mr pearson for um working with the neighbors and addressing the concerns i had last month Thank you. Any other comments? Yes. Um, I just want to share a comment and one that I had made when we originally heard this. Um, I am very uncomfortable with strapping 11 senior homeowners with the maintenance of an underground detention system in private streets, and therefore I can't support this. Um, just as in another case where the comment was made that they needed the proper number of homes in order to support a homeowners association for reasonable dues. Um, this has me very concerned in the opposite direction where we only have 11 homeowners. We have private deten private roads and private detention and they're of seniors on limited incomes. Um, I'm very uncomfortable with that and uh, therefore I will not be able to support the motion. Thank you. Any other comments? Got a motion a second, call a question. Motion carries 3-1 with Commissioner Gorham in an opposition. So that takes us to <coughs> our other business. So other business item 35 was continued to February 67 was continued to February. So we're starting with other business item number 70. Good afternoon, commissioners. For the record, my name is John Peterson. I'm the zoning division manager. The first item on today's uh, uh, other business agenda is other business item number 70 which is to consider amending the site plan for Mr. Albert G. Smurgy regarding his zoning application uh, Z95 of 1997 for property located at the northeasterly intersection of Childers Road and Rock uh, Ivy Trail and at the eastern terminus of Hunters Drive and land lots 48, 49, 105, and 106 of the 1st District. By way of background, the subject property was rezoned to uh, plan a residential development. 
1997 to build a residential development on 57.8 acres with 18 estate size lots. Uh, some of the original 18 original lots are still undeveloped, uh, which are the subject of this other business application. Uh, there have been a, kept, uh, a couple of other uh, other business applications uh, since 1997 to reconfigure the 18 lots. The owner of lots 7 through 10 desires to slightly revise the lot lines uh, for these four lots uh, in order to have better lots in which to build houses. Uh, the access points and private road will remain as they exist today. Uh, all the proposed lots are over two acres in size. If approved, all previous conditions would remain in effect. And we would ask the Board of Commissioners to conduct a public hearing and consider the proposed site plan amendment. Thank you. We will now open the public hearing for other business item number 70. Anybody wishing to speak for or against, come forward. Seeing and hearing on the public hearing is closed. What is staff's recommendation? Mr. Chairman, the staff would, would recommend the Board approve it subject to stormwater management comments. Uh, the site plan received November 11, 2014 with the District Commissioner approving minor changes and all previous conditions not in conflict. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Burrow. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to point out this is lot line reconfiguration and all the lots are still over the two acre minimum requirement. Um, so I would support this and would make a motion to approve other business item number 70 um, with all all staff recommendations and site plan dated November 11th submitted and um, all other stipulations that uh, will remain in effect. Good a motion, a second by Commissioner Ott. Any comments? Call the question. Motion carries 4-0. Other business item number 71, please. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, item number 71 is to consider amending the site plan for Curly Family Homes regarding uh, zoning application Z1, uh, Z126 of, 23rd, of 2003 for property located at the southwestern intersection of New Chastain Road and Blackwell Circle and land lot 371 of the 16th District. The subject property was rezoned in 2003 to low rise office NR20 for an office building. The property was zoned uh, to the site plan with many conditions. The applicant would like to amend the approved site plan in order to in order to construct a 2300 square foot addition to the eastern side of the existing building. The addition will match the existing building with uh, an, an exterior consisting of brick, stucco, and siding with a standing cement roof. Uh, the applicant will also add uh, 23 parking spaces so the required number of parking spaces is met. Uh, the, proposed, uh, the proposal will continue to meet the R20 buffers on the southern and western property lines. If approved, all previous conditions would remain in effect and the staff would ask the Board of Commissioners to conduct a public hearing uh, to consider the proposed site plan amendment. Thank you. We'll open the public hearing for other business item 71. Anyone wishing to speak for or against, come forward, please. Seeing and hearing none, the public hearing is closed. Commissioner Burrell. Thank you. Is the applicant here? Yeah. Gene, oh. Gene's back there. Okay. Um, yes, this... Um, I, I can support this. Uh, they're s still wear well within the impervious under the impervious surface requirements with the addition, and um, also we'll be adding additional parking, and will exceed the requirement for the addition on parking as well. Um, I would like to see the um, I have final approval of the. The site plan once it goes through the plan review process. Yes, John, I didn't ask you what staff's recommendation was. Mr. Um, Chairman, the staff would recommend the board approve it, subject to stormwater management comments, water and sewer comments. The site plan received November 11th, uh, 2014, with the district commissioner approving minor changes, uh, subject to the building elevations contained in the other business item, with the district commissioner approving the final plan, and all previous conditions not in conflict. So moved. So moved. And um, also, with that stormwater management comments, I just want to point out that um, if needed, they will use the pervious pavers. So, and all other uh, comments, I mean, all other um, stipulations will remain in effect. Thank you. 
Second. There's a motion and a second. Any comment? Call the question. The motion carries 4 0. Thank item you. 72, please. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, item number 72 is to consider <coughs> amending the site plan for Mr. Chuck Hill regarding uh, rezoning application Z42 of 1996 for property located on the southwestern side of Cobb Place Boulevard, uh, south of Ernest Barrett Parkway, in land lot 650 uh, and 719 of the 16th District. The subject property uh, is zoned CRC and was approved site plan specific in 1996. Uh, this parcel uh, was, was originally shown as not being developed due to a large uh, rock outcropping near the site. Uh, the engineer has developed a site plan that, that works around this large rock outcropping. Uh, the proposed use is a 22 uh, space parking lot for the expansion uh, of the parking lot for Jared's Jewelry. If approved, all previous conditions would remain in effect and we would ask the Board of Commissioners to conduct a public hearing to consider the proposed site plan amendment. Thank you. We'll open up a public hearing for other business item number 72. Anybody wishing to speak for or against, come forward, please. Seeing and hearing none, the public hearing is closed. Commissioner Gorm, so what is a rock outcropping? It's a big rock. Oh, okay. And they can park some cars around. There you so, go. Thank then you. we have a motion and a second. Any wait, comments? Wait. Call. Wait. Staff recommending it yeah, yeah. is. Let me go ahead and make my, my recommendation so we have. Oh, oh yeah. We're rushing. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the staff would recommend the board approve it subject to stormwater management comments. The proposed site plan uh, and landscape plan dated November 9th, 2014 with the district commissioner approving minor changes and all previous conditions not in conflict. So moved. Sorry, just got excited about the rock outcropping <laughs> there. Call the question. Motion carries 4-0. 72, please, or 73, please. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, item number 73 on today's agenda is to consider a site plan approval for JW Homes LLC regarding rezoning application Z46 of 2014. The property is located on the south side of Paul Samuel Road, on the east side of Aqua Due West Road, uh, at the eastern terminus of Justice Drive, at the eastern terminus of West Point Drive, and at the southern terminus of Liberty Lane, in land lots 237, 258, and 259 of the 20th District. By way of background, the subject property was rezoned R20 OC on October 21st, 2014 for a 175 lot single family subdivision. One of the zoning stipulations required the applicant to submit a new site plan that removed three of the lots from the originally submitted 178 lot plan. Uh, and that plan is attached for the Board of Commissioners con consideration. The three lots that were removed, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, there's one lot that, were, that was removed here from the northwestern uh, section. There's one lot that was, that was removed here from the northeastern section. And there was one lot removed from down here, uh, the southeastern section of the property. Um, all of the zoning conditions would be met uh, if this is approved. Uh, the proposal was submitted to county staff. We do not have any further comments regarding this new site plan. If approved, all previous conditions would remain in effect. Uh, the staff would, write, would uh, ask the Board of Commissioners to conduct a public hearing to consider the proposed site plan approval. Thank you. I'll now open a public hearing for other business item 73. Anyone wishing to speak for or against, come forward, please. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Brandon Bowen. I am an attorney in Cartersville, Georgia, and I represent Mr. David Holmes, who is a property owner on the southeast corner of this property. I um, wonder if I can, we can pull this one up. Great. Um, Mr. Holmes owns, thank you. Gotcha. Mr. Holmes owns this property right here. It is uh, 1.3 acres, and his concern all along has been the density change from his neighborhood and this other uh, low-density neighborhood to this area over here. Um, some changes have been made, which he appreciates. However, as it stands now, he still has basically three small lots backing up to his 1.3-acre lot, and what he would like to see is he'd like to have a one-to-one -one ratio between the lots here and here such that he doesn't have 
multiple neighbors on the back side of his property because of the difference in size of these lots. Um, he has raised his constitutional objections previously, and we would reiterate those, but today we're just here to ask that as you approach final approval of this plan, if you could get to the point, or if we got to the point where density was re reduced here somewhat to get him to that one-to-one -one ratio, he would be happy and he would withdraw his objections at that point. So that's all I have. I'd be happy to answer any further questions that they Thank you. may have. Do you have any questions, Commissioner? Commissioner? Uh, no, I do not. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other speakers? Seeing and hearing none, the public hearing is closed. Commissioner Gorm. Yes, I, I would like to call Kevin Moore to the to the podium, please. <coughs> Kevin, I, I would like to go through the the um, site plan that we have yes. right now, and I've done some review. I've had several copies of of yes. site plans through the course of this zoning issue. And I believe that there was a lot removed uh, kind of up in the northwest section. Correct. Um, That's this section right here. There was. There was a lot removed at, in here. That's correct. Okay. That is correct. And, I confirm um, that. And I had seen at one point that it was a detention pond. And actually, I thought there were two lots removed in that area. There was the, the lots that were removed from the plan that was presented last month when it was rezoned. There was one lot removed here, uh, which is now uh, to uh, David, make sure we... Me. Can you put that on this? Yeah, it's not coming up on our screens. Thank you. You're, you're correct. There, there was a lot that was removed from this section um, and uh, really detention pond that's there now. So there was a lot taken out of here. There was a lot um, taken from this row right. here that was adjacent to this um, to these R20 to this R20 lots here but that's there was a lot taken from here and then there was the third lot was taken out of this row or this boundary here there was a lot taken out here and that was then spread out along that area there correct um, I would like to um make an amendment to to the site plan as it stands right now I, I've always okay. been very much concerned about the r30 properties that are on the um, I'll call it the eastern boundary of yeah right right in there Th those yeah uh, no and going up all those properties are zoned north of that are r30 those are all r30 properties although they exist in multi acre tracks at this point but but right. that is r30. Uh, I concur with the removal over in the northwestern section where we removed one. Right here, yes. I'm happy that we did re remove one in the southeastern section, um, but the removal of the lot up in that northeastern section, um, I'm not thrilled with, and I, I'm going to make a change. I'm, I'm going to change and have an additional lot removed from the from the southeastern segment between lots 117 and 111 as presented on my map. Does that concur with your map, those, those numbers? 117 and 111? Yes. Okay. And so that would be my, part of my motion that the third lot, actually the, the total of three lots will consist of the one in the northwestern section and two in the southeastern section right. now. And that third lot will be removed between lots number 117 and 111. And then you can reconfigure, uh, obviously, the lot that you removed north of that is, is, is you're going to have to work with that or your developer is going to have to work. He does not increase the total number of lots no. that was approved at 175. He may have to decrease the number if indeed he needs a detention pond of some shape or size, but that's not for me to determine. That will be determined at site, at site plan review. And um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank and John, you. if you would re repeat, please, uh, staff's recommendation on that. Uh, 
would you me. would you repeat staff's recommendation please um commissioner gorm the staff would recommend the board of commissioners approve uh, the site plan last revised december 1st 2014 uh, with the changes that commissioner gorm just suggested between uh, the lots on the eastern side uh, with the final plan to be, to be approved by the district commissioner and all previous conditions not in conflict thank you so moved Second. any comment call the question motion carries four zero thank you is that it uh, that completes your printed agenda mr chairman but i would like to take a moment to thank uh, commissioner Gorm for her years of service who Ms. thank you john and if i can take a point of personal privilege take as um, long as you want it was uh land use issues that uh brought me to this seat and it would only be fitting that it would shall be a land use issue that would be one of my uh last official duties um it has been a pleasure working with staff and being able to represent the community in land use ish issues so thank all staff for all their hard work and uh, the answers to my numerous questions um, but uh, i hope that cobb county is a better place that i leave cobb county a better place from a, a land use uh, uh, land use viewpoint so thank you so much thank you thank you good luck to you thank you um, I just want to note that in February we have a very full calendar and we will be taking a structured lunch at approximately noon uh, for an hour on that February zoning for the Board of Commissioners and, and, and maybe dinner I mean well <laughs> or maybe go to Wednesday uh, so without anything further we are adjourned thank you